So I'm calling to order the March meeting of the Vorex Steering Committee. I'm Jackie Dagger, the program manager for the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative, or Vorex for short. Um, we have a pretty full agenda today, so I'm just going to jump right into it and get us going. Um, so I'm going to copy the agenda into the chat so you guys have it. Great. Um, so we're here at 9 a.m. We're doing welcomes. Uh, I'm going to lead our introductions here in a minute. Um, we have a pretty full business meeting, so we're going to start that, um, aim to start that right at 910. Um, we have some speakers joining us today. Um, Ed Bove and Melanie Riddle um, are going to be talking to us about building active, healthy, and equitable communities um, and work the regional planning commissions are doing. Um, so they're planning to join us at 10 a.m. I'm going to aim to give you guys a break at 1030 a.m. and then come back for the second half of our meeting to do a working session on Boric 2.0. Um, we'll start to wrap up around 1150 with public comment and other business and then adjourn at 12 p.m. So we have three hours together this morning. Um, great. So any questions about the agenda before I dive into introductions? Awesome. Seeing none. Great. So I want to I do see that we have a couple of folks who are on the steering committee here with us this morning. Really appreciate you guys being here. Um, we love to see members of the public joining and listening in uh, three hours. We know is certainly a lot of time to be taking out of your work day. So um, thank you for being here um, to maximize our time. I am going to limit introductions to steering committee members and staff and partners who are playing an active role in this meeting. But if you are um, calling in and you're not on the steering committee, I invite you to go ahead and drop your name and organization in the chat. Uh, we really do like to know who's joining and, and um, interested in the discussions that we're having. So when you're ready, please go ahead and do that. Um, I am gonna start with our steering committee members. So. When I call your name, please go ahead and uh, just introduce yourself with your name and your organization. Um, so I'm going to start with the chair of our steering committee, Michael Snyder. Go ahead, Mike. If you can unmute, maybe I'll come back. Okay, I'm gonna. Oh no, there we go. <laughs> oh, there we go. I made it. I'm sorry, folks. I have, as my team knows, I have an iPad that's like 120 years old, and um, it takes a long time. Sorry, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of FPR, Chair of Vorec. Really happy to be back with you all, even if still remote. But hope all's well. More soon. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Josh Hanford, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Josh Hanford, uh, Commissioner of Vermont Department of Housing and Community Development and, and Vice Chair. Happy to be with, be with you again and looking forward to the snow tomorrow. Definitely agreed. Uh, Mike Tabanis, go ahead. Morning, everybody. Mike Tabanis, Executive Director of the Green Mountain Club, and I represent non-motorized outdoor recreation on Vorec. Great. How? Oh, Hal, it looks like you're still muted. That's for sure. Yeah, it's only been two years. I'll figure it out. Um, it's a work thank in you, progress. Hal Elms, uh, from Middlesex, and uh, I'm with Pinnacle Outdoor Group. We're a wholesale manufacturers rep agency in the outdoor industry, representing five national brands, including Darn Tough Vermont. Thanks. Uh, Abby, go ahead. Good morning. My name is Abby Long. I'm the executive director for Kingdom Trails, and I believe I now serve as the Vermont Trails and Greenway Council voice on the Vote Rec Committee. Thanks, Abby. Uh, Kim, go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kim Roop, and I'm with the Vermont Council on Rural Development. Great. Um, and I guess for anyone who is not aware, Kim uh, recently 
change positions, which we're excited to have um, the VCRD uh, as a closer um, connection on the, the Vorex steering committee now. So just wanted to provide that update and uh, Josh, go ahead. Morning, uh, my name is Josh Ryan. I'm the principal of Timber and Stone LLC. We're a uh, trail design and construction firm based in East Montpelier. And uh, it's good to see everybody. Thank you. Uh, Mark. Sherman, and I am the founding owner of Outdoor Gear Exchange in Burlington and um, founding part of VARAC and Vermont Outdoor Business Alliance. And I represent um, the retail community, I guess, um, although I'm not sure how that happened. Thanks, Mark. Uh, Drew. Uh, hey, this is Drew Simmons. I'm the uh, owner of Pale Morning Media, which is a PR and communications agency in Waitsfield, Vermont. Uh, I'm on representing uh, the outdoor business sector. Um, yeah, I think that's all. Thanks, Drew. Uh, Carrie. Hi, folks. I'm Carrie Simmons. I'm the executive director of Outdoor Sports and Water Sports. I'm just Carrie, your sound is um, it's a little quiet. I don't know if you can get closer. Kind of like Mike, I have a, an old computer that doesn't have very good audio, and it, it really only happens with Teams. So I'm just hereby saying Teams, thanks. <laughs> uh, noted. <laughs> thanks, Carrie. Um, I I know so um, there are a couple of members of the steering committee who I'm not seeing here yet. I know Frank Stanley is um, in communic or at the uh, he he has some bills up in the legislature this morning, so he's going to try and join when he can, um, but he may not be able to join. Um, is there is there anyone that I missed who might have joined a little late on the steering committee? Who I didn't call. OK, not hearing anybody, so I'm going to move on to um, our partners and staff who are participating in this meeting. Um, so when I go ahead and call your name, please introduce yourself with your uh, name and organization or department. Um, so I'll start with Kelly. Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Alt, the executive director of the Vermont Outdoor Business Alliance a statewide network of close to 100 outdoor manufacturers, retailers, resorts, guides, media companies, and other types of companies that are all working together to strengthen the outdoor recreation economy here in Vermont. Thanks, Kelly. And then Caroline. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Zeilinga. I'm the commissioner's assistant at FPR, which includes um, supporting VOREC. Great. Thanks, Caroline. I I think that was it. Um, Becca Washburn, uh, our director of the Division of um, Land Administration and Recreation, is going to be joining us. She had a meeting this morning that goes until 10 a.m., so she's going to join us a little late, um, but is planning to be here. Uh, is just pausing, you know, in case I missed anybody. And hearing none, great. Um, so I am going to. Sorry, did I? Oh, I'm getting feedback. It looks like Steve, you're unmuted. If you could go ahead and mute, I'd appreciate it. I was just going to introduce myself. Oh, thanks, Steve. We're actually um, we're oh. only steering committee members and staff and organizations. Yeah, but please go ahead and drop your name and organization in the chat. Um, we love to know who's calling in. Thanks. OK, so I'm going to jump into the business meeting portion of our agenda. Um, we have actually a lot of business updates to share with you all today, so I'm hoping we can move through those updates uh, as quickly as possible um, because we do have our presenters joining us at 10 a.m. Uh, that said, we do feel these updates are important and 
we hope that um, they provide you with valuable information about what's happening in the outdoor recreation economy in Vermont. A lot is going on right now. Um, and as we begin to delve into these things, um, like things like the 2018 action plan, it'll be good to be thinking about what's happening in uh, like the legislature and other priorities in our partner organizations so that we can start to identify where there may be opportunities to align um, with our board priorities. Um, so I'm going to turn the floor over to Commissioner Snyder to lead the approval of the November minutes and the updates from the chair. Go ahead, Mike, when you're ready. OK, thank you, Jackie. And um, I would uh, hopefully you've all seen in the advanced packet the minutes from the last meeting, so I'd entertain a motion. We need a motion to approve uh, to just get get it on the on the on the docket here. Uh, someone want to make that motion? Motion to approve. This is Mike. Thank you, Mike. Is there a second? I'll second. It's Carrie. Thanks, Carrie. Um, any discussion of the minutes? Any corrections, questions, comments? Hearing none, uh, I'll call for a vote. All those in favor of approving the minutes as presented, please say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Hearing none, you've approved the minutes. Thank you. And let's keep it rolling. Jackie set a tight line for us here. Uh, so Jackie, should I roll into updates from me and then pass it around to Josh and partners? Um, so go ahead and give your updates and then, yeah, I, I have a couple of quick updates about Vorek and then we can jump into our, our partner updates. I'll let you quarterback that. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll just begin with with mine then. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to try to speed through these at kind of a high level, and uh, that's not intended to obfuscate or avoid. But uh, so if we need, if there's questions and all, I'm, I'm hoping we can find a way to address them. We certainly want to. So uh, I would begin with in the FY23 budget for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, that would be beginning July 1st of uh, this year. Uh, the governor's recommend includes an, another round of one-time general fund in to the tune of five million dollars for the Volrec uh, outdoor the, the the community grant program, uh, and that has been presented. It's now being discussed in the House Appropriations Committee, um, and I understand that uh, I saw some notes from one committee discussion that indicated there was a sense that that five million dollar could be quote trimmed for other purposes as they look for money here and there, even though there's lots of seems to be lots of money around. Um, I think the good news is what I'm hearing is it's a thought of trimming it for other recreational support as opposed to trimming it and putting it in, you know, the Department of Taxes or something or who knows. Um, so that's what I know uh, will 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 continue to I think my sense is it continues to be well received based on the questions we get. Jackie's done a fine job of providing data about numbers, you know, number the interest, back, the backlog, the pipeline of projects, et cetera. And I think the soon to come announcements about this year's grants will be very helpful in this conversation. Uh, otherwise, legislatively outside of the budget, um, I would uh, mention that I think uh, the House has now passed the Reserve Forest Land Bill for current use, establishing a new subcategory. The point there is, it's not it's not necessarily about outdoor recreation, but along the way, it's raised the you know it's been a, a an opportunity for the conversation to to say what about posting of land, what about incentivizing recreational access on private lands through current use. It's not in the bill, been part of the conversation, and I think that actually helps um, over the longer term. I'll leave that there for now. Um, uh, um, I would also mention that the Act 250 bill S-234 has passed out of the Senate Natural Resources Committee. Uh, it's in House Appro uh, Senate Appropriations uh, before it, um, so it's made crossover and has a chance. It includes the forest fragmentation language that's been in there before that specifically exempts recreational trails from Act 250 uh, from the uh, fragmentation criterion that would be created. 
um, not Act 250 writ large, uh, but that's strong and good. Um, it, in, it includes other elements that we're happy with, but the governor doesn't see enough in it for what he wants, and so currently the administration does not support that bill. That's unfortunate in some ways, but it, if the bill moves over to the House, House members, many of them are interested in working with it, adding some things that might help it be acceptable to the governor. It's a tall order, but specifically here, it's there's an interest in merging with a bill, House bill that includes trails language that's pinned to the wall. That's resulted, I believe, I'm, I'm hoping Abby can sp shed more light on this, but this has led to a conversation with the Trails and Greenways Council, some members of the Rural Working Group, FPR, on the possibility of um, moving forward, but outside of Act 250 legislative battles. Abby, I hope I've expressed that reasonably well, and I'm hoping you'll touch on it further or clarify anything I've said wrong. Um, but so that's just a conversation that's going and and is in play and that, that something could come of it, including, um, you know, some sort of a helpful nudge or added capacity to continue uh, together working towards, um, you know, this, uh, uh, a future for uh, uh, and, a, and an improved way of seeing how recreational trails are considered in the regulatory framework. Um, I'd mention also uh, the congressional earmarks, the so-called congressionally directed spending um, are starting to come out. Senator Leahy approved, uh, announced some funding. I, I, the Huts Association got a nice big bump there, I believe. And I also know that the delegation, all three have reached out to us to talk about the next round of earmarks, as they're called. Um, and I have a whole list of recreation based goodies that I've offered them um, for a big splash, particularly as Senator Leahy leaves. Uh, one would be a Leahy Legacy Trail Stewardship um, investment. Um, so we're going to push hard and go big and we'll see what comes of those. Um, I would just mention in the workforce conversation uh, in our seasonal staff for Vermont State Parks, which were underway. Uh, trying to hire for right now. Remember, we hire nearly 400 seasonals to operate the parks and that frontline service. Whereas normally in February, we would receive three, four, maybe 500 applications. In February this year, we received, wait for it, 38 applications. We are in a world of hurt, just like so many others out there in the workforce issues, uh, et cetera. We can't operate a park system with 38 seasonals. So, uh, Lots of folks leaning in, getting creative. Uh, I offer this out to you folks and hope that you spread the word, tell your kids it's a great place to work, uh, <laughs> your parents, I don't know. But, uh, and also if you have clever ideas about how to recruit or how, you know, you guys do this too. Many of you are suffering the same. I just wanted to share it as a real issue that we're feeling. Um, Becca will be, as Jackie said, joining us a little later, but I think, and she's got a bunch of uh, updates from within the recreation program at the department, uh, URSA grants, the uh, uh, RTP grants, uh, national meetings like Nasorlo, et cetera, uh, and her work to reimagine recreational services within FPR. Becca will be providing those updates, I believe, in writing, correct, Jackie, for you all uh, subsequently. Yeah, Becca will be following up with updates in writing. I'll I'll probably be sharing those out to you all after following the meeting. Great, thanks. I think that covers my updates. Unless Jackie or Caroline, you would remind me something I forgot or that you think is. And otherwise, I'll Jackie, I'll leave it over to you to manage any questions that may arise or to take it from there. Thanks. Yeah, I am curious. You know, before we move on, um, I to some Vorek updates that I have. Are there any questions about the updates that Mike shared? Um, I do see that Drew popped a question in the chat. So Drew, I invite you to ask that if. And that's great because I can't see it. You. Yeah, the, the only question I had is, do any of those FPR jobs include housing or any of them remote trail work or anything like that? And um, because that could help us draw some people in. Yes, uh, that's one of our, you know, strengths. We do actually offer housing in the parks, many of them, not completely. And it's a, and it's a challenge because some rural places, there's no housing. Uh, so it helps us in that we have some housing. We also have a proposal in for ARPA money to, <clears throat> uh, to build out uh, wireless in our parks because that's been identified. Seasonal staff don't want to come live in a park if they can't connect to the wireless when we're, when they're off work. So we're trying, that's like a, a major investment as a incentive to for the workforce. We're also proposing to DHR, that's Department of Human Resources, to get around some of their ridiculous limitations on our wages. 
where we, we whereas we used to be above minimum wage and above most entry level work in these cool places with housing and you know you get to zip around a little golf cart you know the good jobs and uh and uh but now we've fallen behind and we're we're above minimum wage don't get me wrong but you know we can't keep up with other you know service organizations that are paying you know a few bucks more an hour so we used to have, rely on cool locations fun jobs housing some bennies free fishing free parks that kind of thing and we're continuing to try to build those out uh and as well we're looking you know i've sort of stayed out of the housing issue um <laughs> josh but uh you know our stock is behind and we're looking to invest in improvements to our housing stock because drew it's really an important part of our recruitment i hope that makes sense can you can uh somebody post that link in the chat if there's a link to the jobs available or however that goes um and then we can share that around great call thank you for that um caroline would you maybe help make that happen super great yeah and we can also send it out after the meeting as well um great any other questions before we move on great i'm seeing a note about the palm trees and drew's background i was um, gonna leave that alone i saw that too <laughs> um but so okay i'll jump into some quick updates about um things that i've been working on on forec um so an update on the open steering committee positions that we have i know i've been keeping you guys updated through email but also wanted to close the loop here um so just a reminder that we have a couple of positions open um, right now for the vtgc motorized recreation representative and one of our five um, companies within vermont's outdoor recreation industry industry um, Mike and I have uh, connected with Danny Hale and Fraser Blair and had some great conversations. They've both accepted our invitation to join the steering committee and we're working to connect with the governor to appoint them to the steering committee. So our hope is that by the next meeting, um, we can welcome Fraser and Danny into, into our group. Um, so more to come there. Um, I also want to update you guys on the bi-monthly meeting conversation. So I sent you all a survey to pull you on what day and time might work the best for a regular standing meeting. And looking at the survey results, it looks like the second Friday of the month works well for folks in the morning. So from this time, basically from nine to 12. Um, so knowing that, I'm going to go ahead after this meeting and get a regular bi-monthly meeting hold on our calendars. Um, and this is something that we heard from you that having a regular standing meeting would be a good idea just to so we can all plan and make sure that we're available um, for these conversations. So just a quick update there. Um, the grant program. Um, we are getting really close, as Mike said, to announcing uh, VORIC community grant recipients. Um, we're aiming actually for early next week. That's the hope. Um, so I will make sure that I close the loop with all of you on who is receiving grants. Um, we're really excited. There's uh, 24 applicants who were expecting to send um, notifications too. So yeah, more to come there and, and we're really excited to get the word out and um, the full application review committee has been great and uh, worked really hard on this. So um, for, for the steering committee members who were on that uh, review committee, really thank you for your time and commitment to that. Um, the confluence of states, I wanted to give you guys a quick update on my participation there and Mike's participation. Uh, the confluence of states we have a regular monthly meeting and uh, we're working on a couple of things so one of those is hiring a fellow to support the administrative functions of that group um, so interviews happen this week and we're expecting to hire someone into that position pretty shortly um, the confluence is also continuing to uh, welcome new states uh, so Maryland joined most recently, and there's a lot of interest from other states in joining. Mike and I actually just participated in a meeting last Friday that the Outdoor Recreation Learning Network organized 
uh, where they invited new states um, and states who have more experience working with the outdoor recreation economy to participate. And it was it was Mike and I both participated in that. It was really exciting to see states like Pennsylvania showing up there, Minnesota, um, Hawaii. So and a lot of great questions. And I think um, our experience with outdoor recreation economy, Mike had the chance to share some of the knowledge and, and best practices that we've learned through our work. Um, and it was really exciting to be in that conversation and hear uh, what new states are thinking about. Um, so I'll pause there. I see Drew, you have your hand up. So I welcome you to jump in. Yeah, just a quick comment on the confluence of states, which reminded me I had a conversation with some some industry folks in the last week, and they asked me, you know, is the confluence still a thing? Um, and obviously, there's great work going on, but there's definitely been a noticeable decrease in news coming out of the confluence. And I just wanted to pass that up the food chain, um, you know, so that you know you're aware that it's, at least as far as the the business sector is concerned, it's really invisible right now. And you know, it, whether it's departments of outdoor recreation, but specifically the confluence. So, you know, and that's a very anecdotal, non-scientific comment, but I thought I would pass it on. Yeah, I know. I appreciate that, Drew, for sure. Um, I think the hiring of the fellow part of that is um, to support some of these functions that the the confluence has been working on, and and hopefully there's more outreach um, once that person comes on board. And I'll I can pass that message along too. Mike. Yes, thanks, Drew and Jackie. I um that is good input. That's helpful. I would say I would just two quick comments. One is on the fellow, the hiring of the fellow, just to be clear, that's no state money We're it doesn't cost. We're not like it's not coming out of our budget. That's been that's some um, that's funding support from outside of government. And so just to be clear uh, uh, and on Drew's point, yes, I, I've noticed it and I think it's uh, a, a couple things. Um, it's a lot of turnover in some of the offices. Some have like closed uh, Montana. I mean, coming back online, you know, new governor, different philosophy, uh, some leadership changes, the pandemic. We haven't had an event. We haven't had a confluence event, a signing ceremony, uh, a learning session because like nobody went to outdoor to the snow show and we didn't do an event there. So I think that's that's just taking some of the wind out of the sails and I hope it's just temporary. That's um, but it's good to hear that it's noticed, Drew. Actually, that's a good sign that <laughs> that it's noticed, and we will indeed, as Jackie said, share this with the with the team, and hopefully, it's um, we'll get back on track soon. Jackie, I think you're going to mention there's a there's plans for an event at the National Governors Association national meeting, which will be held in Portland, Maine this year. I believe it's Portland in Maine, and there's we're we're working towards possibly an event, a big splashy kind of event in association with that this summer, a summit and a signing ceremony for new states. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that, Mike. Um, got it. And I see Drew popped a question. What What are the dates for that meeting? And and just to um, let you all know, it's not a definite that the signing ceremony will happen with the National Governors Association event where the confluence is exploring that and uh, really wants that to happen. The dates for that are set for July uh, 10th through 13th, I believe. Um, but I can double check that. Um, if if that's not right, I'll, I'll let you guys know through email. Any other questions before we move on to partner updates? Looking for raised hands or folks jumping in and I'm not seeing any. All right, great. Um, so I'm gonna move ahead and I'm just gonna um, call on partners as they're listed in the agenda. So Josh, I'm going to go over to you first. Sure, thank you. And, and much like Mike, I'll start big picture here. Um, obviously, there's a huge workforce challenge. Um, we're having the same issue with our seasonals at the state historic sites. Not only that, but even hiring um, staff full time in our agency. You know, we have had huge budget increases with the ARPA money and other funds, and we have lots of open limited service positions, you know, three year positions, and we're just not seeing the number of applicants we used to. 
and um, you know our sort of bureaucracy and, and our HR department of uh, you know existing uh, positions that have you know certain levels of years of experience or education requirements, and we can't just change those willy nilly like you can in the private sector or nonprofit sector. It literally takes months, and 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 we are having um, challenges with people not qualifying for jobs because they don't have five or 10 years of experience like an old posting from 10 years ago required um, where where we would take someone right out of college you know um, and so it's it's really interesting what is going on right now but uh, we're seeing this with all our partners as well um, you know we've just had tons of people exit the workforce and um, you know, I can comment on some of the reasons I think why that's happened and some of the support and aid that is maybe um, not encouraging people to get back into the workforce and that may continue for many months ahead. And so um, there's a lot of um, efforts both from the governor and the legislature, you know, our agency to try to bring um, uh, some solutions to these workforce challenges. But I think this is here to stay for a little bit. Um, on the housing side, um, certainly tons of um, initiatives put forward by the governor to help address the housing challenges, you know, both building new where we need it, investing in existing housing stock that's underutilized. You know, that's a good solution that meets lots of goals of, you know, reinvesting that we have. We don't need to build huge new neighborhoods when we have over 19,000 housing units in Vermont that are substandard and in poor condition. All you have to do is go to some of our, you know, historic older communities, you know, whether it's Springfield or Rutland or St. Johnsbury or Rockingham or Bennington, or I can go on and on and you can drive through neighborhoods and see vacant homes um, and you know, apartments that aren't used. And, you know, we're trying to address those first, uh, but build new in some places, continue to move people out of homelessness. You know, we still have over 2000 households in hotels and motels right now um, in Vermont. Um, and, you know, and that has an impact on the industry as well as people converting uh, their other properties to short term rentals to take up the, the, the need that's out there, which exacerbates the long term affordable housing needs. Um, as well as if anyone <laughs> has looked to buy a house recently, I think most Vermonters with you know pretty decent jobs have been um, squeezed out of the housing market that exists. And so we need to encourage the production of more homes because literally builders, we need to encourage and subsidize because literally builders can't build a new home for what a working class Vermonter could afford to buy it for. So uh, the market is completely, um, it, it's broken. And so the governor has a lot of solutions out there, huge uh, money towards this effort. And I'm gonna sound a little political now, but you know, frankly, um, when it comes to money being allocated to solve solutions, it's all about politics in the end. Um, there's a lot of support for these solutions, but right now, most of these budget bills to carry this work forward have been laden with policies and um, poison pills that are going to make it a challenge. Um, so something that we all say we support building more housing, especially affordable housing, um, seems simple. But when the bill is um, peppered with um, multiple things that the governor has already vetoed and new major policy initiatives which sort of shift priorities layered on those bills i'm very disappointed that we can't just all agree more housing is needed and let's pass the money we could have already been building this housing the governor put it in his budget adjustment act to continue things we've all agreed we need that could have already been passed we could have already had housing starts you know come thaw with developers and it's all been bogged down in um special initiatives that uh, various you know legislative um folks want to stick in there that is giving us pause whether this is going to get to the finish line or not and in a year when it's not about money we have tons of money to then throw these sort of poison pills into 
this process is quite disturbing. And so, you know, you, you'll hear more probably about this and, you know, um, various, uh, you know, radio interviews and things that we're doing to say, what are we waiting for? The money is already there. We could have already supported housing um, construction, but we're, we're being held up by, um, you know, sp special initiatives. And so that that's sort of political, but that's the reality. Um, to switch to more Vorak related things, um, I, I think that there's some good efforts underway in partnerships with FPR and, and ACCD on a EDA grant where there could be some new money to support um, it, other infrastructure projects that support out of state visitation and overall visitors experience, you know, long term funding um, for for projects like that that can't find funding from somewhere else, as well as, um, you know, destination marketing activities, strategic planning, um, just this really a lot of stuff that supports the goals of ORAC. It hasn't been funded yet, um, but it's underway. It'll have a two year scope and Jackie and, and the team have been heavily involved in sort of crafting this. And so we'll keep our fingers crossed that that comes through. Um, and then there's also existing efforts underway with the northern border regional money we have. Um, we have, uh, you know, about a hundred grand media buy out there to support the outdoor rec industry in Vermont. Um, some additional funding, maybe for some more support for um, Vorak. Uh, you know, we've got a lot going on and, and, and trying to work on the best way to um, get that support with our northern border grant money. Um, and then as folks have mentioned, you know, some sort of way to, you know, maybe um, host an outdoor economy council meeting, um, or there was one just hosted. Sorry, I'm reading some notes from uh, some other uh, partners in our, our agency and um, getting ahead of myself here. But some other regional planning uh, for, with the Northern Forest Center and, and some convention work going on. So there's a lot of Josh, coordination. Yeah, so I can... maybe you're gonna talk about it. So I'll stop. Oh, yeah, no, and not sorry to interrupt, but since you're on it, we did just have a meeting um, with the MBRC states that are funded for um, ORIC offices and with the Northern Forest Center led a conversation about an opportunity to do a regional summit. Uh, they're looking at fall 2023 and uh, they're getting together a steering committee to start planning for that event. And uh, I'm I'm on that steering committee, so I'll be um, coordinating on behalf of Vermont and uh, linking in other folks as needed. There may, as we get started, be an opportunity to bring on some of you guys in, into those conversations. So um, wanted to put that on your radar and uh, I'll I'll be keeping you informed as um, this thing picks up a little more speed. Cool. Um, yeah, I'll, so yeah, just one last thing, because Mike's note, you know, just reminded me that, you know, we're having major employers in approaching us about how they can build housing for their own workers, which is tough. Most employers don't want to be both employees and landlords. You know, what happens if someone quits? Are you going to now evict them? Um, so that's really not the best solution. You know, that company owned housing was something that we did back in the Industrial Revolution and um, it doesn't really work, but yet that's how desperate folks are. Even contractors, you know, big builders are saying we can't build the housing you're paying us to build because we don't have a place for our workers to live. They're driving three hours, sleeping in their truck. Um, and so this is, you know, this is it's getting pretty serious. Um, so any efforts you all have the communications with your local legislators to say, let's fund housing and not tie up other um you know <laughs> you know issues in this in this desperate sort of uh need right now it would be welcome i think you all have challenges from your employees uh, and and housing issues so um you know happy to talk offline about any of that if you want great thanks josh and i see mark you have your hand up go ahead yeah, I just want to sort of say thanks for mentioning that housing is definitely an issue. My staff has struggled to, you know, a lot of them live in shared housing. There's several outdoor gear exchange houses around Burlington that just rotate as one person moves out, another moves in. 
Um, <clears throat> and many of them are looking for purchasing houses and having to buy real big fixer uppers that are a half hour, 45 minutes out of town, which is going to become more uh, problematic if the current gas price situation is maintained in the country. Um, another issue, though, I think that it is related to us and all the businesses in Burlington, whether it's Ski Rack in Patagonia or some of the restaurants, is the safety of co of workers. And um, I've I've been in communication with the mayor and the city, the police in Burlington, but um, we can do as much workforce development as we want in this state. But if my workers are getting assaulted on the streets and have nothing that they can do and that the um, the uh, AG or the um, public public uh, attorneys aren't willing to make change with the legislature in some of the uh, laws that would allow us to take some people off the streets or provide them with the services that might keep them from um, stealing from us, et cetera, and putting my employees at risk, I think that would really help. I've got one employee who is, um, has moved into a management position in charge of our loss prevention. And uh, he is now applying for other jobs within the company and potentially leaving the company and potentially leaving Burlington because he was um, hit by uh, someone on the street while he tried to get back some stuff that was stolen. And the police can't really support him. And um, the laws don't support the police in supporting him. So I think as we're building the workforce, we need to think about all of their needs and safety might actually come ahead of housing. Thanks, Mark. Um, Josh, any other updates or any other questions for Josh? Comments? Great, I'm seeing none and um, I know we do still have two folks, uh, two partners to hear from, so I'm gonna move on. Um, so Abby, you're next uh, for VTGC. Thank you, Jackie. Um, <clears throat> I actually have a very well-crafted update because I believe the last time we met Vermont Trails and Greenway, I was taking a little bit of a hiatus. <laughs> um, and I did mention last time we've had a leadership change, so I'm no longer the co-chair of Vermont Trails and Greenway Council. Um, so I crafted this update with um, Nick Finette, the new uh, Vimba ED, who's the new co-chair, along with Danny Hale, who sounds like will be joining GORIC. Um, they're the new co-chairs of the council. So um, a couple of updates. First, the council's working on creating a, a really snazzy looking educational pamphlet to clarify what Vermont Trails and Green Bay Council is, what we do and why we do it. Um, we all kind of realized uh, the past few years as we were working on the alternative oversight program um, for trail oversight that uh, this taught us that many of the stakeholders um, just do not have a good idea of our work and specifically the best management practices that we've already deployed um, and uh, the dedication that we all collectively have for environmental and community stewardship. So we're really hoping to, to distill that into a really quick like one page or a white page that can be uh, easily distributed. So when that um, we're kind of in the home stretch of crafting that and um, making sure it looks good and is catchy. And so I'll, I'll hope to share that with you all uh, when the time comes. Um, also, we submitted a request for funds for administrative support. Um, and this request went to Representative Sims and Kimball um, and really this has been a long time coming. It's um, in order to more effectively fulfill the Vermont Trails and Greenway Council mission. Um, things are very slow moving on our end. We're a group of volunteers that have our own nonprofit organizations that we're in charge of. So it's pretty hard to move things forward when you're you're stretched thin. As you all know, everyone's at max capacity. Um, so we're requesting 150,000 in one-time funds for a program manager. Um, and these funds would support basically a part-time staff member employed by the Vermont Trails and Greenway Council, even though funds will probably flow through uh, Forest Parks and Rec. And this would be for three years. Um, and, and we really do believe that it will help, you know, enhance materials and communications. Um, and uh, like I said, positively uh, move things forward. And um, a third item, uh, Vermont Trails and Greenway Council intends to consolidate and organize and publish our collective uh, best management practices and um, and are beginning to work towards integrating these management practices into the Vermont Trails system. And this is a shared vision with Forest Parks and Rec. 
And uh, we really want to begin to elevate and strengthen the Vermont Trail system such that it's seen as like a symbol of stewardship and one that will, uh, <clears throat> you know, be an example throughout the country. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, Michael mentioned legislative and Act 250 work and um, really quick, it's, it's actually not really much, but on the omnibus, omnibus bill, um, I'd simply note that um, the council supports everything in H581, um, but we understand that a lot of important stakeholders that we enjoy and love working with and, and know that it's essential to work with uh, do not. And so we are actually not pressing to see the recreational trails provisions in the bill move forward, um, though we do believe um, you know, significant portions of it could pass without any real opposition and, and would provide helpful clarity on current oversight, like rule 71 that I always talk about. <laughs> and members of that Red Wing uh, group that Michael was a part of who were touring this whole past summer, um, they are keeping an eye out uh, for other bills to which these like non-controversial uh, provisions could be added to. Um, though we understand that it's um, not a high priority this session. So I think, I think that's a quick update. Okay. Thanks, Abby. Yeah. Mike, I see you have your hand raised. I do, thank you. And thanks, Abby. That was uh, well said and uh, helpful. And I just thought it would be important to note that um, uh, where the request for added capacity at the council is concerned, mm -hmm. just to be clear, we support that, uh, but it's not in the governor's recommended budget. So that makes it a little bit tricky for us to talk about. And mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that when it, if and when it kind of emerges as an actual thing to consider that the governor will support. Um, but I just can't go in there guns a blazing and say, we're asking for this because it's not in the budget, right? So, um, but we do support it and want to be clear about that. Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Great, any, um... Any questions or comments for Abby before we move on? Okay. Um, and seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and move on to Kelly uh, for a VOBA update. Great, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. So I'm going to provide an update on the work of the Vermont Outdoor Business Alliance. Um, we've been pretty busy this winter on multiple fronts, which are all related to the VORAC work and our opportunities for collaboration now and in the coming months. Um, we have been working in an over, in, overall, we've been working on our policy uh, work as it relates to the outdoor recreation economy. We've been identifying challenges and opportunities around the outdoor workforce. We've been advancing justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion within VOBA as an organization and in support of our businesses and organizations that are doing some great work within their workplaces and in outdoor spaces. And we've been developing some marketing projects for the spring and summer, which can elevate some of our outdoor communities, um, outdoor recreation opportunities, and link them to the businesses that can provide goods and services in our communities. So a few details about some of those. Um, our policy work has been um, a big, conversation and is definitely a close link with Vorak and a lot of the work that you're doing. Um, we have identified our four buckets for VOBA have been infrastructure and stewardship, economic and workforce development, outdoor recreation, marketing, and a healthy landscape and climate economy. And those are our general buckets that we do policy work with within. However, as a very small group with limited capacity, we have decided that we will focus on one, um, one to two, outdoor specific policy efforts and proposals that we will be we will be leaning in. We have been and will continue to lean in on as well as one kind of business development. Um, we feel that it's important to do at least one of each because they're interlinked. And so the work that we've been trying to do to advocate for investments in the outdoors has been to support the VORAC uh, $5 million proposal um, and we have submitted testimony into House Commerce on that. And we have echoed that uh, through testimony with the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board uh, fund support of which we also submitted testimony. Drew Simmons testified on behalf of VOBA. Um, so we're supporting those two investments in our advocacy because we believe in that those pillars of the natural and recreational resources 
um, as well as um, our outdoor communities are the backbone of our outdoor recreation economy and the foundation for which our outdoor businesses can operate, grow and succeed. Um, on the work for, I mean, on the business development front in terms of policy, um, we've been trying to follow the economic development bills um, and, the, and the workforce bills, and then also the workforce conversation or the housing conversations as they're related to the outdoor workforce. Um, and our policy committee has been um, following 703, the workforce bill, um, and we had submitted some recommendations um, about some of that aspect, some of the tenets um, of it, investments within that bill that we support. And so I'll just describe them generally, and I'm happy to provide some detail um, outside of this meeting. But uh, generally, we are advocating for increased investment around the workforce education, training, recruitment, and the prioritization of resources for the outdoor sector. Um, we like that there are a lot of provisions and proposals for building out laddered credentials within our state college system, within the career and technical and education system, um, because a lot of the high demand, high skill, and, and growing and increasingly high paying positions in our outdoor sector are technical positions. They are trades, they are bike mechanics, trail construction jobs, um, they are around gear and, and apparel manufacturing, and a lot of our education institutions have um, resources um, to expand into that area. So the more support we can get, we can build out these opportunities to get degrees and certificates and training for our companies and create that talent pipeline for the immediate needs as well as in the future. Um, we're also really excited about some of the um, training dollars that are being, training programs and training dollars that are going to be that are being proposed, um, whether that's for the Vermont training program that have really helped some of our companies, um, or whether that's for um, you know apprenticeships or internships or experiential learning opportunities uh, that a number of our companies are interested in hosting and being a part of. Um, I think dedicating career navigation resources is important to the outdoor sector because we have a lot of employers that we wanna to bring to the table and support job placement and these experiential learning opportunities. And so being able to talk about the outdoor sector as a highly diversified sector, as um, offering a number of career pathways and being able to talk about what those pathways are and what, um, what those outdoor professionals interested in getting into the industry, moving around in the industry, um, are can expect, expect um, when they are looking for work or they are looking at um, opportunities for themselves. Um, and I think ultimately we also want to support some of the resources um, that are working to reduce the barriers to hiring BIPOC, LGBTQ, new American refugee women in all ability populations. And there is a program with the Vermont Professionals of Color Network um, that's in H07, kind of supporting some business support to um, Black entrepreneurs, outdoor professionals. Um, and so we want to continue facilitating those conversations. Um, on the economic development side, there are a lot of pieces to that, but programs like the Capital Investment Program, uh, we know that outdoor companies have applied for funding for facilities and that that can prove to be an important source of funding for our company. So we definitely want to support that in other economic development programs that are emerging. Um, so that's kind of the summary on the um, on the economic side. I, I see that Mike, you have your hand up. Did you want to jump in now or do you want? Yes. I, thanks, Kelly. I'd love to just ask a question on the workforce uh, training development. There's, there's the career tech ed initiatives the governor is pushing, right? And um, uh, I'm just so I've recently engaged with the governor's staff, policy staff on he, it's been heavy to the trades, which is appropriate. Yeah. But I've been like, hey, there's like, you know, like you mentioned, there's bike techs and trail people and it could say the same on the forestry side of things. So I've asked them, you know, is it possible to broaden this? They said, OK, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, sorry, we missed that. And I'm wondering if you've been engaged in that or might help with that nudge to broaden it and have the awareness be that there's opportunity to grow the economy and workforce through outdoor recreation as well, not just the trades in the tech centers. Yes, yes. And I'm happy to follow up with you on opportunities to do that, whether that's specific legislators to talk to or specific um, cases to present to great. the administration. That would be great. I know we've been talking a lot about um, the bicycle industry as a climate economy 
a component because of transportation and commuting, um, there are a lot of opportunities to link in with climate, the climate economy discussions in transportation, uh, as well as not, as well as the workforce pieces. It's a great point. Um, so happy Thanks, to Kat. follow up with that. Um, we are engaging uh, the outdoor community in a series of focus groups and interviews this, uh, this month. Um, and we met with 20 retail shops last, uh, actually it was just this week. It's been so crazy um, to identify some of their needs for workforce, for recruitment, education, training, and retention. And we definitely plan on summarizing those um, and identifying those recommendations for the short term and the long term. Next week, we're focusing on outdoor gear and apparel manufacturing. And the week after that, we're focusing on trail construction and outdoor facilities um, and what they're looking for. And beyond workforce, we're also asking questions about business and technical assistance. We know that there are tremendous needs for that kind of support, whether it's financial, marketing, um, st strategic planning resources, uh, that outdoor companies need as they continue to navigate the opportunities and prepare to be ready for summer and fall and welcome visitors um, to the region and support their customers um, within capacity. So definitely these questions in this research is about gathering some of those technical assistance needs and figuring out how we as an association can support them or how we can facilitate the matchmaking with those um, business resources that are out there that can help. Um, you know, one example is, I, this is about the fish that, that got away, but uh, she fly, which was one of our favorite stories of a women led outdoor apparel manufacturer just uh, decided to um, host their, uh, relocate their headquarters to Gunnison, Colorado, and they beat out Burlington in terms of looking at different locations. And so understanding from their experience about how they were able to benefit from um, economic incentives from um, support from Western Colorado University that has a business resource lab and has an MBA in the outdoor industry, how the town, the mayor of Gunnison actually worked to get some funding and support and open some doors to bring them to Gunnison. And even the Outdoor Recreation Office of Colorado admitted that they actually upped their strategic fund incentive um, by threefold to beat out Burlington. So I think that there's a lot that we can do together and that's hopefully a hopeful story that we can continue working together to collaborate, to figure out what are the resources that we have available between Borac and Boba to support these companies to be able to stay in Vermont and grow in Vermont um, and then benefit in terms of jobs and um, economic opportunity. I just wanted to quickly go on because I know we have another um, guest at 10 o'clock, but quickly talk about our marketing project in the spring that we have received another grant um, from Agency of Commerce to support a second base camp insert in Vermont Sports Magazine. Uh, we produced our first guide and outdoor business um, insert in, I think it was the winter of 2020. And this time we'll be able to feature uh, Vorak communities and, and package the recreational opportunities and the businesses that can offer services, gear, uh, places to stay, places to eat, um, and tell that story about Vermont just in time to welcome people to our state for the summer. Yeah, and just to note that Kelly and I will be working on that together, and um, they're talking about what communities we can highlight knowing that um, there are a lot of communities who may not be ready to receive um, to to be highlighted but we're going to make sure that we work together on that so we're um, calling out the right the right folks um, thanks kelly for those updates and abby and josh um, really appreciate that um, we are at 10 a.m and I, I see that melanie riddle and ed both have joined us so i'm going to transition to their presentation, um, but really quickly before I do, I just want to reiterate that, you know, we do feel like these business meeting updates are important and, uh, you know, intended to give uh, steering committee members uh, insight into what's happening in the outdoor recreation economy. I think um, these updates, I was keeping track of some challenges and opportunities I was hearing, and I think those will be really useful as we get into the second part of our meeting today for the Vorek 2.0 discussion. I, you know, I heard Mark talk about safety for um, employees, you know, Josh talking about housing, um, education and training for skilled workers, barriers to hiring BIPOC. So I encourage you all to be keeping track of those and uh, I think it'll be really useful during the second 
half of our meeting. All right, so I'm gonna uh, turn it over to Ed Bove and Melanie Riddle here in a second. Um, I'm really excited to have them here with us today. Um, they're gonna be talking with us, as I said earlier, about um, Vermont Regional Planning Commissions and what the work that they're doing uh, through a grant with the Department uh, of Health. And I'll let them explain that further, but by way of introduction. So Ed Bove is the Executive Director of the Rutland Regional Planning Commission. He has been working in his position for the past eight years, and before that worked as a planner for five years. And Ed is originally from Rutland, but spent time in Arizona for school and work before moving back to the state. Um, and Melanie Riddle is an assistant planner for the Lemoy County Planning Commission. Uh, before taking her position in September 2021, she worked for municipal government as a grant writer and zoning administrator. Um, and her background is actually in sustainable agriculture and community food systems and nonprofit management. And a uh, fun fact, I really like this fact, she was a cheesemaker for seven years on a goat farm and still works on the farm doing milking chores. So if you have questions about milking, Melanie is the person to talk to. Um, so with that, um, Ellen, Melanie and Ed, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, Ed is going to talk with us briefly about, um, you know, the work that RPCs do around planning, um, and and then he's going to turn it over to Melanie to talk a little bit more about the the grant through the Department of Health. So, Ed, take it away. Great, thank you, thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. Um, happy Friday. Can you hear me all right? I've got trucks going by. I'm in downtown Rutland, so thanks. Um, so I'll spend a couple minutes talking about regional planning commissions in general, and then I'll turn it over to um, Melanie to talk a little bit about this specific Vermont Department of Health grant we're working on. And so um, regional planning commissions are political subdivisions of the state of Vermont um, in statutory terms, and there's 11 of us representing all the towns in the state. So uh, Rutland, we have 27 municipalities that we represent. Um, and we in RPCs are all about 50 years old and we're really a creature of the towns in that we're used by the towns on all fronts to just help them succeed in what they do. So across, you know, everyone would think land use, which is town plans and zoning, but there's also emergency management, there's energy planning, there's brownfields work, a lot more in the water quality world that we're doing. Um, transportation, a little recreation. Um, we're starting to get more into now through some of this other work and some health work and focusing a little more on the health piece is we've never actually had too much work with the Vermont Department of Health to do healthy planning initiatives. It's always kind of been through our other programs like town plans or transportation. Um, all the things I named off earlier. And it's a funny thing because health and wellness and planning, there's there's so much like what is that, right? Is it, you know, planning for in this case being or having access to recreation? Um, is it more designing communities to be more walkable, which then reduces other health impacts like obesity or social isolation? Or does it get granular to, you know, designing roads in street widths that reduce pedestrian deaths? Is is that, you know, a healthy community? Um, is it agricultural access and food deserts? That sort of thing. Is it crime where you, you know, just putting front porches on buildings that face the street is proven to reduce crime? So is that a health impact? So there's always this, these healthy community this work that we've been doing indirectly and now working with the Vermont Department of Health and I'll turn it over to Melanie. Um, we actually have dedicated funding that's going to go towards the RPCs to do healthy community design work, which could encompass all the things I mentioned earlier. Um, but it's great that we now have something that we can actually dedicate to healthy community design, which I know is um, important to this group. So um, 
that's a, a quick overview of RPCs in general and why we're here. And does anybody have a question on that before I let Melanie talk a little bit more about the specific work we're doing? Just looking at the participant list to see if anyone has a raised hand. Um, and not seeing any. OK, okay well, um, if not, then um, I'll turn it over to Melanie, who's with the Lamoille County Regional Commission, and we're so thankful that they're picking up the um, the administrative and lead work on this grant that we're about to do. So, and Melanie, I didn't know you were a cheesemaker or a zoning administrator. Um, See, fun facts. <laughs> that's, that was a great um, intro. I didn't know that. So cool. Great. Well, thank you, Ed and Jackie, and everybody for having uh, myself and Ed on to talk a little bit about this uh, grant that we have from the Vermont Department of Health. And basically the funding for this grant originated from uh, the CBC. Um, and I know they have a lot of money uh, and some of it is actually kind of being funneled through the Better Places um, program that they kind of revamped um, in February, 2022. So that's kind of looking at more of the physical improvements. Um, and then what we're getting from the Department of Health is focusing more on the health equity language. Um, and within there, there's also like prevent and control COVID-19 again. So that's kind of the funnel down of the, of the funding. And specifically the populations that we're looking and there's like a list of them, so I'm gonna read them. So people of color, indigenous people, refugees and English language learners, LGBTQ+, people experiencing homelessness, Vermonters who are justice involved, people living with disabilities, and people living in rural communities. So again, if you think about the whole state, that's quite a lot, um, you know, specifically the rural piece. Um, that is a lot of our state, as you all know. And, you know, again, this funding is to focus on the 3450 goals of the Vermont Department of Health, so increasing health equity, and improving access to physical activity and healthy food. So that's kind of the big part of the language. And then getting into the meat of what um, the RPCs are gonna be doing. Again, there are 11 of them in the state and um, Lomel County Planning Commission has been selected to be the lead on kind of herding all the cats of the other RPCs of, you know, basically we're kind of all working together and but LCPC is more involved in um, making sure the deliverables are met and doing the reporting. And some of that is involved with the state engagement model meetings that have been going on for quite a while that I know Ed has been um, a part of. And so I'll be joining that as well, um, as well as other members um, to kind of participate in that and continue the conversation and make sure that we engage with lots of different stakeholders, uh, specifically people with like lived experience. Um, of the populations that I mentioned. And one of the deliverables of the grant uh, that we need to come up with is a health equity toolkit. And this toolkit will be designed to help municipal leaders increase their understanding and capacity for including health equity language in planning. So basically to have a document that helps improve language within town plans and um, within kind of like zoning bylaws or subdivision bylaws, or flood, even flood hazard regulation bylaws um, to kind of just make sure that, that health equity piece is there and that we're not we're really helping to include everybody in the conversation. And the other part of this grant that we're also going to be doing is kind of teaching or teaching the planners to help um, disseminate this information as well. So uh, we're going to come up with a toolkit, which includes looking at other state, um, other states in the country, what they're doing around health equity work, um, and kind of pulling from that and then kind of synthesizing our own uh, toolkit that really makes sense for Vermont. You know, again, you're looking anywhere from Richmond, Richford, uh, Rutland, um, Springfield, St. John's very, you know, it's a, a pretty exhaustive list. Um, so making sure that it would be applicable to all of our smaller municipalities as well as our larger spaces. And um, <clears throat> so we're going to be doing the planning and then we're going to be doing the toolkit. So the toolkit also, aside from the research, all of the regional planning commissions will be kind of reviewing the drafts and making sure that it does make sense for um, all of our communities. 
And let's see. Um, so aside from the kind of like model bylaw or kind of these like language that wants to be included in uh, the toolkit, you know, it can also include, as Ed mentioned, you know, kind of the physical barrier, physical space or healthy community design. Uh, Lamoille Planning Commission was involved with like a healthy community design project previously a few years ago, I believe, with their from And the other portion of this grant also in have, we have funding to, once we develop the toolkit, to actually work within the communities and implement um, some of the aspects that we come up with. So um, I think that's a good overview. And then let me know if there are questions. Thanks, Melody. Um, I do see Becca has her hand raised. I also just quickly wanted to mention, I forgot in my introduction to um, say, you know, we have this pillar on VOREC for um, promoting and enjoying the health and wellness benefits of outdoor recreation. So one of the things I'm really excited to have Ed and Melanie here is to speak to a little more about what's happening across the state in terms of um, promoting uh, health and wellness. Uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Becca in a minute, but I am curious, you know, as we're getting into q and um, I'd, I'd be thinking about, you know, what are some of the challenges or opportunities to doing this work? Um, things that uh, Ed and Melanie, you might be thinking about that Vorek could be um, a partner in. Uh, and so I'll just leave that thought there. And um, Becca, I know you have your hand raised, so go ahead. Thanks, Jackie. I apologize for being a little bit late. I had to conflict. Um, so I missed a little bit of your intro, Ed. Uh, you may have already covered this, but sort of related to what Jackie was saying about being interested in understanding where there's overlap with Vorek in the development of our strategies and actions around health and wellness related to outdoor recreation. I wondered if you've identified as part of the toolkit that you hope to develop, if there are sort of tracks that you expect to be the categories of tools developed for municipalities. Like I heard you talk about, you know, front porch, you know, developing front porches so that they reduce crime and probably thinking about walkability and um, just a whole host of different sort of categories of health equity improvements that communities can be striving for in their plans. I wondered, you know, if you have those already identified, are there ones that are clear overlap with Vorek and the work that, that we're hoping to help implement in advance? Um, but maybe, maybe not yet, maybe that's part of the process and we could be integrating in once that part of the journey is, um, is complete. So um, I'll answer that. And yeah, that's definitely, it hasn't been developed yet. And that's a great idea. Um, you know, again, we're kind of looking at other examples and any kind of input, you know, a big part of this is to involve, uh, you know, the people listed um, in the populations that are you know, usually marginalized. And, you know, again, the public as well. So you know, this committee um, would be great as well, exactly what you just said. So as we kind of develop it, that will Come out because yeah there's you know also if you think about a town plan there's clearly many different aspects so it could be the land use it could be um, I'm blanking on anything else right now but there are many different areas within a town plan that um, we could definitely highlight absolutely I like you I see so many opportunities thinking about um, where environmental justice uh, fits into like you said land use energy uh, renewable energy goals uh, development in flood hazard areas, uh, open space protections. It, it's all, it, it, it's really exciting. It's all there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the RPCs are helping put on a green justice zones workshop um, with a consultant on March 23rd. Um, Melly, I don't know if you have, I can try to find that link and put that in the chat. Oh yeah, I've, I've but it would be great if you could find it. I've, I've signed up already. OK, um, which might be interesting, Becca, to tie into your comments. So let me see if I can find that quickly. Thanks, that sounds great. Thanks, Ed, and I can also send that out after the meeting if you can't find it. Um, 
I see Carrie dropped a message in the chat and um, I, I'll call that out since I know Carrie you're having some um, audio issues, but Carrie just said that she'd like to see a piece in the toolkit encouraging communities to assess their outdoor recreation opportunities um, and consider how they could improve uh, these and improve access to them. So I uh, just wanted to call that out and I guess maybe a question to you, Ed and Melanie, if, if um, you know, that's possible if you're already thinking about um, uh, talking about that in the toolkit conversations. Yeah, everything everything is on the table pretty much. You know, again, we we haven't the ink is not dry on the grant uh, agreement yet. So, um, and that's taking a little bit longer than we anticipated. So we're just kind of coming into this now, and we haven't even gotten you know everybody the troops organized in terms of going out and gathering information. So, um, you know, we do want to the recreation and healthy community obviously it's all tied together so we really want to incorporate every you know the, everything as much as possible into the toolkit carrie did i get that was there anything else you wanted to add um i was just kind of thinking that there are so many different ways to think about equity in that access piece and so um figuring out ways to not only assess what is there, but to evaluate it based on the communities that you mentioned that are really the target of how can you increase access to outdoor activities for people limited and, um, are able to access that. But yeah, no, that was perfect. Yeah, there's, I mean, we will be looking at, you know, there, there's the natural environment, there's the built environment, there's the aesthetic element, social environment, making sure that, you know, are there physical barriers, you know, specifically for people with disabilities. Um, so all of those aspects do come together and that's why it can range from, you know, wider streets to thinking more about like that social piece and walkability. Great. Um, anything, any other questions or comments? Um, I am, I am still curious, you know, Melanie and Ed, if you see opportunities for groups like our steering committee to be involved in that process. I know, you know, Carrie mentioned wanting to see certain outdoor recreation opportunity pieces um, are there other opportunities to engage in the process that we should be thinking about as we develop the toolkit you know as with most things uh that you know the rpcs are involved with there are we will have some public engagement opportunities um, public comment periods so i'm sure as those are developed and we have like reviews of drafts um, and kind of that is pending, you know, I definitely see an opportunity there as well as, um, you know, reaching out and having a conversation with me, you know, if there's something particular that you want to see um, that we haven't addressed in this meeting here. Um, that's kind of where I see the best opportunity to kind of, you know, involve you all at this point, but I'm also open to it because again, we're just getting this started and this, this grant goes through uh, May of 2023. So we do also have like a, you know, a quick turnaround. So we're going to be hitting the ground running and working on it. Um, so, yeah. There's also going to be money for communities directly um, through that's going to get, that's going to flow through the RPC. So, um, Jackie, I don't know if, you know, whatever community everyone is here is from, there could be money to do implementation projects. So um, there could be some direct work that could happen. And that shifted a little bit. Um, oh, it has. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you haven't been, since you're no longer part of the lead. Never mind. That shifted, but we will, basically it's been moved to uh, the RPCs of money to work on the implementation. So it's not for like individual projects. Again, that physical structure is gonna be more of that better places grant, but we will be working within the communities to implement the language and the wording and kind of getting those policies and things shifted um, and, the, and the conversation started. 
Great. Cool. Thanks. Carrie, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, I kind of was thinking about how the the Vorek grants are very closely tied to what you guys are working on and some of the proposals that we receive are less prepared than others. And if there was a way um, for communities who do want to make that outdoor recreation connection to be linked to the Vorek Committee as we have funding available, or even if we don't, because there's so much um, that so much information out there that's come up through the Vorek grants. Uh, is, if there's any way of um, not necessarily combining, but making sure that the communities that are interested in Vorek grants have, make sure that they've seen this toolkit, if it does have information about how to um, assess your outdoor recreation opportunities and capacities. And that could also feed into people's readiness to apply for a Vorek grant and, and trying to tie it to a funding that way and tie our program back to kind of a training opportunity. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, um, I envision a toolkit. I definitely like to have like a resource component. Um, so including resources, organizations, you know, kind of. You know, we want to provide. The tools for these communities to be able to be successful. And so exactly what you're saying, if you're getting grant you know, applications that are not fully fledged out, can there be more kind of planning within those? And I think kind of including that would be really great. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Carrie. I know that's something we've been turning over, you know, with the full application review committee for this round, um, just thinking about, you know, how do we, how can we provide better technical assistance for communities and and certainly, um, yeah, I think that's something we should keep thinking about uh, whether the toolkits that you, Melanie and Ed are developing, um, whether that there might be opportunities in there to build connections with uh, for community grant applicants. Um, great. Any other comments or questions for Melanie and Ed? The um, you know, during the, the second part of our meeting, we're going to be thinking a little bit more uh, deeply about our Vorek pillars and challenges and opportunities since 2018 that, um, you know, just just getting a, a sense of the landscape of the outdoor recreation economy. I I wonder, Melanie and Ed, you know, are there. Are there do you anticipate that there are, you know, challenges that communities are going to face with implementing these toolkits, the conversations um, that you might be leading to develop these toolkits that we can be thinking about in our work? I think, you know, for the smaller communities, definitely kind of just like the staff time or the municipal, you know, who's it's we're relying on planning commissions. Um, you know, some most smaller towns don't have, you know, they have a town clerk um, and you know, not a town administrator or anything else. So, you know, again, it's gonna be, which is why there's money within each RPC to kind of make sure that these do happen. And then outside of that, there, you know, at least in Lamoille, there's several communities that don't have zoning. So the in those areas, we're looking specifically at the town plan and what language we can include there. Um, and then then you kind of go into the bigger, broader, you know, concept of like infrastructure, and what's already there and what isn't. You know, we have a lot of dirt roads. So when you talk about like road improvements, you know, I think you're mainly also looking at kind of your village areas and your neighborhood development areas. Um, and a lot of those are also built up. And if you, you know, want some improvements, there's a lot of things like the right of ways or, you know, um, you know, if you're looking at some of the social aspects too, or when you want to improve the built environment, you're looking at water and wastewater um, limitations. Um, so I do think that there's um, quite a few bears and I'm sure Ed, you know, he's had a longer longer tenure than I have in this, so I'm sure he might have something to add to that. Actually, I don't, Melanie. That was pretty good. <laughs> okay. Great, I see Becca has a hand up. Go ahead. 
Thanks. Um, just again, in a similar vein, uh, looking at how to help us launch into thinking about this particular pillar as we develop our, our next sort of 2.0 action plan. I'm wondering when you were developing the grant proposal that you're talking about, if there were organizations that you looked to to help you develop some of your concepts, um, if there are any groups that you would recommend, like, oh man, it was like really eye-opening to meet with X, Y, or Z. Because I would expect that we'll be inviting other guests in to talk to us as we're thinking about what actions make sense for, for us to be advancing in this next phase and would love any uh, insights or advice you have based on having done the work to develop this great proposal. So I don't know if I was more involved in the beginning, but I was not a part of any sort of grant application. Um, so I'm not entirely sure on the come around. But I do know that, you know, the RPCs were included because, again, if you're looking at you want to do something statewide, it's really hard to work with each individual mun municipality at the state level. And that's kind of, you know, literally why we have the regional planning commissions, because, you know, we are the ones that get to know the towns that are working with them frequently. And so that's kind of like the, the trickle down. Um, so I think it was just kind of like conversations of when the health department you know received this large grant how do we want to um so i think they wrote the grant they got the funding and then it trickled down to us because thinking about how do we actually reach the deliverables so i think yep. that's yeah that makes sense and through the stem work that we were doing the two the action plans that came out of that identified a lot of other yes. organizations that yep. should be part of the process. So I think that's where that might show up. That's a great suggestion to refer back to that list to see if there were some um, organizations that we aren't as familiar with that we'd wanna invite in to get acquainted with. Yeah. Thanks for that reminder, Ed, that's awesome. Great, that's it for me, Jackie. All right, any other last thoughts um, before we let Ed and Melanie go and we break. Not seeing any. Um, I am curious, you know, for folks who have been involved in the development of the action plan, you know, if there's any anything that is sparking like your interest or anything that Melanie and Ed have brought up that you're like, oh, yeah, that really aligns with what we're thinking about around like promoting health and wellness um, and that pillar. I'll just put that question out to the steering committee. Great. Well, not hearing anything and uh, we're pretty much at time. So if anything and and there may be things that come up in the second half of our discussion today that you know Melanie and Ed we might want to reach back out to you about and uh, I I hope that you know you're open to that and really do thank you for making the time to be here with us this morning and talk to us about the work you're doing um it sounds like there could be some potential opportunities to think about outdoor recreation in the toolkits and um yeah, really um, just thank you for being here. So I, I'm i gonna let Ed and Melanie go and I'm gonna give us a break. And uh, so I'm gonna say 10 minutes. So let's break and come back at 1040 and um, we'll jump into our Vork 2.0 discussion at that time. See you guys soon. Thanks, Thanks Ed and Thanks, Melanie. Ed, Melanie. Thanks, Ed. Have a good one. Enjoy the snowstorm. <laughs>
Hi, Jackie. Hi there. Hey, Kelly. Good to see you. How are you. Good to see you too. I'm glad we can meet on Monday and catch up. Yeah, me too. It's a lot going on, it sounds like. Yes, but all good end. stuff. Mm -hmm. How's your Friday going? Good. <laughs> good. Good. We have um, 15 menu. I'm just about to get the agenda out. 15 manufacturers for Monday for our focus group. So I know you're joining that as well, but it should be an interesting discussion. And I hope to, yeah, that we can glean a lot of the needs um, and opportunities for, you know, to advocate for and to put in place. So. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited about that conversation. Um, for folks who are coming back um, from break, when you're ready, go ahead and turn your video on so to let me know that you're back at your computer. Um, we're going to get going here in just another minute. True, it's just so sunny where you are. Yeah, I'm in Arizona, actually, so it's all good. Every time you turn your sound on, we just hear these like incredible sure. birds. <laughs> awesome. Okay. I think we have most folks back. So I'm gonna jump into the second half of our meeting. So welcome back. Hope you got some coffee or in Drew's case, enjoyed listening to the birds. Um, I know over here we're waiting for a lot more snow, so <laughs> um, not as many birds flying around. Um, so we're using the second part of our meeting uh, as a work session today focused on Forec 2.0 or the next phase of our work together. Um, my hope is that our discussion builds on the discussion we had during our last meeting where we broke out into small groups and talked about opportunities to work together in new ways. Um, there were a lot of really great takeaways from those small group discussions, um, and those were recorded in the November meeting minutes, which I hope you all had a chance to look at. Um, you received those through email, and I'll also be posting them shortly on the website um, for anyone who's interested. Um, I've also been looking and referring to those takeaways uh, between last meeting and now and implementing some of your suggestions. Um, so just wanted to take a minute briefly to note uh, what those what those actions are. Um, so we heard from you in the small group discussions that uh, you'd like to see more regular updates. And uh, one of the things that I've done is start to send you weekly updates on uh, the legislative sessions that are happening and noting some conversations related to our interests here on Forec. Um, we also heard you say that uh, you'd like to see more tasks related to your areas of expertise. And I, was, I did do this a couple meetings ago, but I also did it for this meeting, uh, pulling out some pre-meeting questions um, to help you all connect with your outdoor recreation communities. Um, so I hope you got a chance to look at those questions and have some conversations and uh, and hope hoping that those conversations can inform our discussion here um, this morning. Uh, we also heard you ask to continue bringing in speakers and we heard from Melanie and Ed uh, just before the break and yeah, as we were talking about, we will be looking to bring in more speakers and uh, if you have ideas on people who you'd like to hear from, definitely encourage you to reach out and share that um, with us. Um, I also want to know, I want to make sure that the work I'm doing supports your needs. So at any time, I welcome you to share feedback with me on how it's going. And please let me know if you have ideas um, or needs that I'm not addressing. I, I welcome you to um, connect with me on those um, either through phone or email. Um, I'll also mention that uh, I have a couple of other work priorities that I have on the horizon um, for strengthening our group systems. And I wanna mention that I do see that, Mike, you have your hand raised, so just wanna pause and um, do you have a question related to I have a what comment. I was talking Thank about? You, Jack. Yeah. Thank Go you, ahead. I have a comment. I just, am I the only one who's noticing this trend that 
throughout the meeting, Jackie's re reflecting. Uh, she's been listening. She's reacting and she's doing things every day in support of Vorek. Am I the only one who thinks this is outstanding? This is very cool. Talk about 2.0. That's what we need. Thank you, Jackie. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Thank you, guys. It is pretty exciting. Um, I'm enjoying the work. Um, so, OK, so going back to my update, so there are a couple of other things that I wanted to put on your radar just that I'm starting to think about and looking at. And you'll probably be starting to hear from me between this meeting and next. Um, the first is uh, our charter and bylaws. I think part of having a strong uh, group is making sure that our charter and bylaws are up to date. Um, I don't know how many of you looked at our charter and bylaws recently, but there are some parts of it that don't reflect how we currently work. Um, so I will be taking a look at that document and suggesting some updates. And you may hear from me between this meeting and next, just uh, asking for your review of some suggested updates. Um, the other big priority that I'm thinking about is the Vorek website. Um, the website, I feel, is a really important engagement tool for um, sharing with public stakeholders the work that we're doing, the conversations we're having, and um, I, I think that there is room for improvement there. Um, so I would love to start talking about that and, and hopefully in collaboration with you all. And I'm imagining that that could look like a smaller group of us that get together to uh, talk about the website and brainstorm opportunities um, for information sharing there. Um, so just before we get into our discussion, I wanted to see if that uh, feels like work uh, you're interested in, um, if anyone in particular is interested in being part of a smaller group that talks about the Vork website. Um, and I'll just look for a quick raise of hands. Um, and, and I'll also send this out through email too if you're not quite ready to volunteer. But anyone who feels drawn to those discussions about the Vork website? Seeing a couple, Kim, Drew. Um, great. And um, I do see that Brian, you have your hand raised at this time. Um, we're limiting uh, participation in the meeting to steering committee members, but I encourage you to hold your comment until the public comment portion of the meeting. Thank you. Or drop it in the chat. Um, great. So then we've arrived at the more collaborative discussion part of our meeting. Um, we're going to be jumping into a conversation about the 2018 prioritized action plan. Um, so again, as a reminder, I know Brian, we just uh, talked about this, but this uh, portion of the meeting, we are asking steering committee members to be the primary participants. Again, like folks who aren't on the steering committee who are calling in, we really appreciate you being here and listening in. And we do have the public comment portion of the meeting um, at 1150 where we'll be opening it up um, for any questions or comments you have related to our discussion. Um, so the purpose of the discussion today is really to reacquaint you with the action plan. It's been a long time since we looked at the action plan and talked about it. Uh, you know, it's 2018, I believe, is the last time we really focused on it. Um, so we want to reacquaint you with what the action plan is, what it looks like, and also think more deeply about how the outdoor recreation economy has changed since the last time this document was worked on. Um, this concept probably sounds familiar to you since we started talking about changes to the outdoor recreation economy when we met last year. Um, but today I do want to talk, um, take that those conversations a step further uh, and start to link changes in the outdoor recreation economy to our five work pillars. Um, so the purpose being for us to create a better understanding of where we are now uh, so when we start to look at the specific actions outlined in the 2018 action plan, we have a better working understanding of what actions we, we may want to add or prioritize. Um, 
I also want to note that as we start looking at the action plan, we may identify opportunities to engage more directly with communities. Uh, those ideas are very welcome, and we should be thinking about how we want to involve our outdoor recreation communities in this work. Um, so I'm going to pause there and uh, just see if there's any questions before we dive into our discussion. Great. Not seeing any, I'll keep going. Um, so today we're going to be working in a mirror board. I know I sent you all an email uh, before the meeting and uh, we worked in a mirror board during our small group discussions during the last meeting. So I, I'm hoping you have some familiarity with this tool. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and drop the link to that mirror board in the chat um, for anyone who wants to participate on their own computer. Um, if you don't want to participate on your own computer, that's totally OK. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to walk through it together. All right, and so quickly before I share the mirror board and as folks are jumping in there, I am I do want to do uh, uh, get a little gauge on where folks are at with the action plan. So I have a couple of questions for you and I'm hoping we can just see a quick raise of hands. Um, so my first question is who participated in the community conversations that happened in 2017? Okay, I'm seeing it's jumping around a little bit, but I'm seeing how Mike, Carrie, uh, Becca, Carrie, Tom, yeah, Carrie Thomas. Or you, Carrie, you're raising your hand, right? No comment. Yeah, great. Um, Mark, awesome. Um, who was part Drew, of the original? Drew had his up too. Drew had his up, hand up. Great. Um, who was part of the original creation of the plan? Pretty sure Mark was there too. And the who is uh, yeah, involved Jackie, in creating Jackie the plan? Um, and so the question is, who was involved in the creation of the plan? Quick raise of hands. Great, Mark, Drew, Hal, Mike. Okay. Um, and then this one is a. It's not meant to call anybody out, but I am just wanting to know uh, who has looked at the twenty eighth teen action plan in the last year. <laughs> great, great. Seeing a variety of. Yep. OK, Josh, great. Seeing seeing a good amount of people. Thank you guys for taking a look at that and being um, familiar. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and get the mirror board up here. Can you guys see that all right? And yes. I do I am I do have I am able to see you, but I, I have you on a separate screen. So if I'm looking the other direction, um, know that I'm still paying attention to you. I'm just uh, I'm dealing with multiple screens here. Um, so glad you guys can see the mirror board and it looks like we have a couple of people in here. Um, so the first thing I want to do is provide you with a reminder. It looks like most people have been looking at the action plan, but just for the sake of getting us all on the same page, I want to start with an overview of, uh, of the plan and a quick reminder about what that looks like and what's included in that document. Um, and if you'd like to follow along uh, in, if you are in mirror board and you'd like to follow along, you can go ahead and just open the notes icon there and click the first link in um, that note tab and it'll take you right to the slides that we're going to talk about. Um, so yeah, what what is the 2018 Prioritize Boric Action Plan? How is it created? So we mentioned the 2017 community conversations, um, but Actually, there was a two day conference in Grafton that kicked off the process of creating the action plan. So that happened in August 2017, and it was focused on outdoor recreation and rural economic development. Um, and certainly, I want to note I am not the expert on the development of this action plan. We saw some folks with raised hands who are. So 
if I'm misrepresenting anything or forgetting anything, um, I invite you you all to jump in and um, and contribute. So, um, so yeah, there was this two day conference in Grafton and which brought together a lot of different stakeholders in the outdoor recreation economy. Um, that kicked off a series of community conversations that were held around the state, which it, it looked like many of you participated in. So those conversations happened in Arlington, East Dummerston, Hartford, White River Junction, Island Pond, Rutland, St. Albans, and Waterbury. Um, and there were some other uh, so there were some other avenues that stakeholders had to provide comment to the Vorex Steering Committee. There were comments collected through email, um, as well as comments collected through write-in survey. Uh, for folks who were involved in the creation of this document, anything I missed? Anything you want to add? Great, seeing none, I'll keep going to what this document looks like. So, as a reminder, the 2018 action plan is linked on the Vorek website uh, for anyone who's not on the steering committee who's listening in. Um, that is the place to find this document. And um, what's the structure of it? So there's a there's an introduction page that introduces the content of the action plan, uh, which basically says that it's guided by three key principles, and those are inclusiveness, balance, and interconnectedness. Uh, the rest of the document is laid out as a table and organized by a series of objectives, or well, the strategies in the plan are organized by a series of objectives. Um, so what are those objectives? So there's eight objectives outlined, um, and those include regional pilot programs, economic development, funding, workforce development, marketing, private-public partnerships, access and participation, and stewardship. And then the strategies that are laid out under those objective categories, there's about 40 strategies listed. Anything else to add for folks who were involved in the writing of this plan? Anything I'm missing that you want to add? Great. Not hearing or seeing any. Um, so to help inform our discussion, I reviewed the action plan and actually started to pull out um, or try and assess, you know, where the strategies align with our VORIC pillars. Um, just to, you know, kind of a do assessment and full transparency. I was the only one that did this and this these numbers are based only on my review. Um, but I think it is interesting to see uh, where the strategies fall in terms of our VORIC pillars. Um, and many of them met, I felt, multiple pillars. Um, so the numbers in the number of aligned strategies column don't equal 40 exactly. It adds up to more um, if you were wondering about that. But if you look at where the act, where the strategies align, I think it's interesting to note that uh, you know for promoting and enjoying the health and wellness benefits of outdoor recreation, there's relatively few strategies identified, um, and there's more identified for like growing outdoor recreation related businesses and strengthening the quality and extent of outdoor recreation resources. Um, so just an initial assessment there, I think as we dig into the action plan, um, these are things that we can be thinking about and talking about more. And, um, and certainly I hope that the presentation that Ed and Melanie gave this morning prompted some, some ideas that you might have and wanna bring into our discussion. Um, before I move on, any anything to add here? Any questions, any comments? I see, Drew, you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to um, say that the growing of outdoor recreation related businesses at the time, that also uh, a big part of that was retaining those businesses. And I think I just want to be clear that that word grow it's not necessarily we're trying to double the size or triple the size of existing businesses. A lot of the conversations were about how do, how do we keep businesses that are here in Vermont and make sure they stay in Vermont. So I just wanted to put that out there. Great. Thanks. 
Thanks for that context, Drew. Anyone else want to add anything before we move on? All right, great. Um, all right, so let's get into our brainstorming activity. So for folks who are following along, um, you can click the link to the brainstorming activity to get to this section of uh, the mirror board. And I'll zoom in here in a second, um, but I wanted to uh, note that there are a couple of ways as we jump into this discussion that you can engage. Um, so you can, if you are in the mirror board yourself, uh, you will be able to zoom in on these sticky notes here and add comments yourself by double clicking the sticky note. Um, if you are not in the mirror board and um, you're just following along with me on the screen, uh, you're welcome to drop an idea or a comment you have in the chat or um, raise your hand and I'll be looking for um, and looking for raised hands and calling on folks as we go. Um, so just as a reminder, we already talked about this, but I, I did share some pre-meeting questions with you, um, encouraging you to connect with your outdoor recreation communities to think about you know, new opportunities and challenges that they're, um, that Boric may want to think about regarding our pillars, um, changes that have happened since 2018 to now. Um, and I want to start with our health and wellness pillar since we had Melanie and Ed um, join us this morning. And we do have about an hour, well, 50 minutes for our discussion. And uh, the last thing I'll note before I open it up to you all is that it's, you know, we're gonna see how this goes as we go along. And if we don't get to all of the pillars, that's okay. Um, we'll try, but uh, I wanna make sure that we have the time we need to uh, talk about have to have this discussion. All right, so with that, I am going to turn it over to you and suggest that we start with this promote and enjoy health and wellness benefits of outdoor recreation pillar. And uh, maybe we start with thinking about any new opportunities that uh, have have come up since 2018. So Abby, I see you have your hand up. Um, thanks, Jackie. I'm happy to write too. I just, I tried to, and it was like so small. So I just thought I'd speak up. Um, I think a new opportunity, and I know it's listed the, the mental health of benefits of outdoor recreation, but I do think in the wake of COVID-19, especially that we should start weaving in, um, <clears throat> that outdoor space is you know, a safe place to gather, um, a place to uplift spirits and fortify your mind and body, um, you know, during such a isolating time. So, and I, I know that wasn't talked about in 2017, obviously we didn't know what was ahead of us, but I think it, it is, um, it, that outdoor space is essential. So yeah. it needs to be mentioned now. Thanks, Abby. Mm -hmm seeing some thumbs up from Becca. Drew, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I I think I have both an opportunity and a challenge in that area. I mean, I think one of the opportunities is, is that nationally, there's been a lot of uh, uh, increased awareness that the outdoors is a welcoming place for people of all types, of all backgrounds, of all races. And I, and I think that's a hugely positive thing and an opportunity we should embrace. At the same time, there's a challenge, and I, I've talked to some friends who, are, and they they also see the simultaneous storyline of overcrowding and overuse of the outdoors. And I have a friend who said, and I, I can almost quote him, "Oh, great! Now that brown people are outdoors, you're trying to shut it down." And so I think there is a uh, we have to seize this opportunity, but we also have to make sure that. Um, that the, that the overcrowding and overuse conversations aren't impacting our ability to welcome all people to the outdoors. It's very, 
it's complicated. It's red meat on the table, but I, I think it's just, it's just a dynamic to be aware of. Thanks, Drew. I'm seeing some other notes being dropped in the chat, so increasing opportunities for all participants to learn and hone their skills. I think that ties pretty nicely to what Drew was just saying. Um, and and yeah, so looking for other hands raised, other opportunities or other challenges that that you all see for as new new opportunities or challenges since 2018. Anything that's become easier? I see Mark, um, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I think um, I've, I've had some conversations with a few people on this call about this already, but I <clears throat> I think that, you know, anyone who's tried to ski at any of the major resorts, especially Stowe, Untimes, Sugarbush, Old Killington is similar. Um, we really need to try to address some of the access issues uh, because I think that's actually impacting the communities in which these resources dwell negatively. Um, whether it's you know half of the mountain road in Stowe being a standstill parking lot for an hour and a half in the morning in one direction and an hour and a half in the morning in another direction. That's bad for local businesses, which is going to reduce support for the resources being developed in the way that the rest of this plan is asking them to be and for additional inclusivity. Um, I think, you know, Epic or Bale Resorts has developed a really wonderful system that addresses their needs of income, but doesn't address and, and in theory makes the experience more inclusive because it's more affordable, but it becomes less enjoyable and it's going to drive people away. But um, from an environmental aspect as a, um, you know, uh, outdoor recreation is built on the outdoor, the health of the outdoor community. And if uh, we have an hour and a half parking lot with idling cars um, twice a day in a, a valley like Stowe's, it's just, it's not good for anybody. Um, and I realize this is, this is a potentially a Vail Resorts problem and um, not necessarily for them to deal with, but I'm not sure that's actually the case. I think they've created the problem and, and it's unfortunately ours to solve um, because it is a problem. And so I just want to make sure that we are addressing that. Um, I would hate to focus on accessibility and building of resources without addressing how that that process might harm the other resources that we're here to support and defend. Yeah, yeah I'm seeing some other challenges going in. Um, related to what you're talking about, Mark, so motorized recreation. Um, and I'm not sure if that one's done yet. Uh, Carrie, I see you're writing one on climate change and, and carbon transportation solutions. Mm -hmm. Mike, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Thanks. I just uh, appreciate Mark's comment and I think I'm one of the people he referenced having spoken to about this recently and just wanted to follow up and indicate that indeed in real time I was I was on a meeting this morning with Vale Stowe on this very issue uh, and am eager to have help basically from Volrec and elsewhere. I think this is a good opportunity um, particularly to uh, where we're looking to bring together with the town of Stowe kind of beyond Vail, but um, a Route 108 corridor transportation visioning and, you know, this putting this all in the mix and having kind of an or, uh, organic grassroots approach. Um, so I think there could be a, a place for uh, a voice for Vorak and others. Um, and I'm just trying to carve that that space for the conversation and just by way of a little bit of an update and, a, and hoping to indicate that we're, we're hearing and um, there may be an opportunity and, and help would be helpful. Thanks. I just uh, dropped that as an opportunity into the, into the board, um, the Route 108 transportation visioning. Um, great, Carrie, I see you have your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, in direct response to that, my husband does a lot of work in climate change and, and carbon solutions. And one of the, the transportation solutions is often something like a bus rapid transit situation where you don't have to build <laughs> um, kind of a new transportation corridor, but you allow more people to get through uh, in if they're using public transportation. I don't know 
how the 108 corridor could really accommodate that, but figuring out how to reduce the number of cars and, and increase the public transportation potential, you know, it's kind of an, an interesting crowd to do that with, but um, it, at some point, something's got to give. Great. Yeah, so hearing transportation planning being a challenge to promoting um, health and wellness and engagement in the outdoors. Yep. Um, all right, I'm looking to see if anyone else has raised hands. Um, Mark, I, I see you have your hand up. I, I do want to just see if anyone who hasn't spoken yet has anything to add here. I don't know if we've heard from Hal or, or Abby yet. Uh, you I might just be dropping it in the board. I, I just dropped one in there actually on regarding motorized recreation. Uh, great. Yep. And sorry, I mentioned that before you finished writing. So that's motorized recreation, creating a healthy environment. Um, so finding a healthy environment, I think, yeah, being the the focus and making sure that we're and we're making sure the environment stays healthy. So, Mark, I'll go back over to you. Um, I know you're waiting. Go ahead. Well, just really quickly, I, I realize I focused on some of the issues that we're seeing on Route 108 and corridor, but I think this applies to almost anywhere where we're seeing increased use outdoors. And I know we've talked about that, but if you go to Snake Mountain on any weekend day, the parking goes all the way down probably for a mile from the trailhead, and that's going to impact again the local community. And so I think we just need to make sure that we continue to focus on addressing the, um, the, the downside of the upside of us increasing um, use of our resources that we can't just ignore that because eventually it's going to it's going to come back and hurt us. That's all. It be in the challenges already, but I just dropped another note in the to the board. Josh, go ahead. It's really echoing the same theme, um, you know, having planning for public transportation to these highly used areas is critical. We're already behind the curve. I think, you know, um, spending a, a lot of time in the Killington area, I, I think it's not really known that they have a really good transportation system. I mean, you can get on that bus to Rutland, all the stores, all the different areas for free, you know, almost any time of the day. And it is uh, essentially prevented um, that place from shutting down and it needs to be duplicated in other places. It can be incorporated in with not just the resort, but community, you know, needs for transportation and, you know, overwhelming, you know, increasing in, in cars and um, it, but it also, there, there, you run into some challenges with other, you know, permitting and protection of, of uh, you know, development of our natural areas that something's got to give because you have to do these larger transportation planning efforts, which may impact other resources we all value in order for it to not be a slow, uh, you know, death by a million cars that we, because we didn't want to take um, the, the time out to, properly plan for and give up some of our our other areas we protect to deal with this transportation issue in a holistic way. So I'm just supporting that effort and it's not just 108, it's all over the place. Thanks, Josh. Becca, go ahead. Thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> Taking maybe a slightly different tact. Um, when we were looking at the first phase of the action plan, collecting data was a really important um, consideration and, and maybe we haven't quite gotten where we wanted to be with understanding uh, where there were gaps in uh, recreational assets, the types and the location of them related to population centers. I could see under this health and wellness pillar, um, renewing our commitment to gathering data to better understand where, um, if there are particular populations that we're trying to uh, make recreation more accessible and available based on their terms, uh, figuring out spatially how to understand that uh, so that we can develop some strategies based on, on what we learned from that data. Great. 
And Becca, would you consider that a challenge or an opportunity? Uh, I think let's keep it in an opportunity because the the we've learned so much from COVID and we could do a mapping exercise now that would look very different than it might have in 2018. Thanks. Great. All right. Um, any other comments to add here? It sounds like, you know, we've identified transportation, uh, the encouraging increased use of outdoor recreation resources. Uh, those might be new challenges uh, related to promoting health and wellness, um, but some opportunities, the awareness around mental health benefits, um, increasing opportunities for participants to learn and hone skills. Uh, those are some opportunities. Um, Becca, did you have another comment or? OK, I did. Um, uh, I was thinking about one of the things that we've either grappled with in smaller groups or even as the larger uh, committee is <laughs> trying to define outdoor recreation. And I have Jessica's mantra in my head. If it's outside, it's in. Uh, but even when we think about that, we still are sometimes trying to splice you know what what is outdoor recreation when we're talking about Vorek um it would seem to me that again if we're thinking about new audiences folks uh that we see interested in in gaining the health and wellness benefits of outdoors and nature uh maybe there's an opportunity to either collect information from new users or um just continue the dialogue around what we mean when we mean outdoor recreation, whether that's a picnic in a pocket park in an urban center or a really wild experience on the long trail. Um, I think our committee would benefit from talking a little bit more about that and maybe benefiting from uh, getting some input from from folks that are starting to use the outdoors in new and different ways. Great. Hal, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just, due to my uh, woefully inadequate skills with the Miro board, I, I just, I just deleted some comments. I think under the opportunity, mm -hmm. I apologize for to whoever wrote that, and I think I deleted. Okay. Well, if you if you wrote comments in the Miro board, please definitely double check and make sure that your comments still recorded there. Thanks for calling that out, Hal. No shame. <laughs> Um, all right, so just looking for any last comments, um, I think I'm going to move us on to another pillar if I think we've covered this one pretty thoroughly. Um, all right, so let's go to our next pillar. So increasing stewardship of outdoor recreation resources and environmental quality. Um, so again, thinking about since 2018, since the original plan was created and the changes that have happened from 2018 to now. What are some new opportunities or new challenges related to increasing stewardship of outdoor recreation resources? And I'll look for hands raised and and please, if you're in the mirror board, definitely go ahead and start dropping your comments into the sticky notes. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, well, I think this is the sort of the big obvious one. I mean, when we created these pillars initially, we were trying to figure out how to incorporate stewardship among a fairly limited amount of users. And now we have, in some places, double and triple the amount of users, including significantly number, significantly high numbers of new residents. And so I think the stewardship equation is has evolved and changed. And it's just interesting. I think when we first put it in the action plan, it was something we kind of knew we needed to do and it was you know a little bit about upkeep and now it's potentially should be moved up to number one on the list i mean i think talking about stewardship and that idea of promoting the vermont ethic is is something that voba has been talking about and trying to wrap our heads around and I, I think everybody's trying to wrap their heads around it purely based on the number of new people that are out there great and drew i put that as an opportunity with the New users, uh, there's an opportunity for uh, 
me better messaging. Does that kind of get what you were saying? Okay. Hearing, hearing none. Um, so, uh, Mike uh, Devonis, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> Just to add a thought in there, I can also plug things in in the mirror board. It's interesting reflecting back on the conversation around stewardship. I think Drew's right. It's always the it's a tough one to get your hands wrapped around and, and identify concrete things to to solve the problem. I think when we had these initial conversations, it was a lot of it was like, well, increasing increasing resources and increasing use of those resources. And you know, we've really we've seen that. And some of the challenges we've had are have been around long term funding sources for stewardship and it seems interesting we there's a lot of money out there right now and you know one i'd encourage us maybe to think strategically here at, or at another small working group about ways that we could access resources in either an endowment or direct funds that could build over time and really support the stewardship of of these resources that we've been building over the last few years the the long-term maintenance is going to be you know i think our it's our biggest legacy and it's going to be our biggest burden you know probably for the next couple generations thanks mike um uh mike mike snyder go ahead thanks jackie um yeah underscoring both what mike said and drew uh you know i think it was as Mike just captured it, already was sort of we were behind on stewardship. And then with the spike in COVID related spike in participation, that just increased. So the challenge has gotten even worse. The opportunity I might suggest is that um, people are noticing that. Both people are noticing that there's a spike in participation, people are noticing that that's really good. People are noticing that that brings extra pressures and challenges that we've been talking about on the environment, on parking, on traffic. Uh, and I would say that's an opportunity uh, to that we've not had before to go hard after a dedicated um, revenue source for I'd like to think of the Vermont Trail Stewardship Trust Fund that is has a has a dedicated revenue source. Think of the the Vermont Housing and Conservation Trust Fund that gets a portion of the property transfer tax to go to v VHCB in support of housing and conservation. It's brilliant. Um, it's got notwithstanding language that frustrates many that says notwithstanding that statutory purpose, we can use it for all kinds of other things. And that's a perpetual fight. But I am going hard at something similar, not taking from that, but a different kind of pool for um, the, I, I, to create the Vermont uh, Recreation Stewardship Trust Fund with a dedicated source. That Mike, like Mike said, that grows over time and actually gets us to capacity. I'd like to think that that's just an idea, and I've pushed it in the past, and it's there's not been an opportunity. I'd like to think that collectively we can now sort of marshal forces, take all this interest, and create the opportunity. I think the opportunity exists, and we need to go find it. Um, I'm I'm eager for that. So I, I, I'm trying to be po positive and hopeful that maybe we can actually crack this big nut now with all this new attention and some money. Thanks, Mike. Becca, go ahead. Thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> Again, going back to the effects of climate change, um, I wonder if including, oh uh, boy, I don't know again whether it's an opportunity or a challenge, uh, but we have emerging recreation types like fat biking that represents a great thing for all of us to do when the skiing is really bad and the mountain biking is really bad. Um, so I see, you know, new sports emerging. I see um, the types of trails that we're building that are more um, resilient to uh, increased use and increased weather events. So like flow trails for mountain biking are much harder and, and more durable than um, sort of our traditional squiggly trails. Um, that's a really technical word, squiggly. Uh, so just thinking uh, increases in, in winter use, just generally people getting out and um, accessing land in the winter in in greater numbers than we used to see uh i just i feel like we could get away with 
not having specific management strategies that thought about those increased uses or new um, twists on 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 activities, particularly on public land, uh, and it, more and more we're, we're needing to think about, well, what does this mean for our, our management objectives? Uh, do we have to change the way we approach management in particular areas because of increased popularity? So um, climate change, again, sort of challenging us to, to be thoughtful about our stewardship obligations. I, uh, I dropped a couple of notes in the chat there, Becca, or the mirror board based on that comment. Um, Abby, go ahead. Um, I dropped these in the little squares as well, but just building off what Becca was sharing, um, I think there are some tools that we could support trail groups and other outdoor rec spaces um, that we, we could um, start evaluating and, and exploring a little bit. Um, you know, KT has been looking at LIDAR mapping, you know, and like annually, if we were to look at using drone footage, um, looking at terrain to see the annual impact that's happening and can pinpoint erosion areas and, you know, plan your trails more accordingly, train your, train, uh, plan your outdoor recreation activities more accordingly, knowing um, maybe avoiding some areas or knowing where to build in particular um, could help some long-term sustainabilities of these assets. <clears throat> and then one more thing I dropped to, you know, stewardship, of course, we haven't mentioned landowners, the private landowners, which I mention all of the time, so I'm blue in the face, but <laughs> just continuing to explore new opportunities. And I know Michael already mentioned it earlier about <clears throat> continuing the conversations about not quite current use, but something similar model. But um, Katie's even looking at whether or not carbon sequestration or carbon tax credits, you know, forming like a cohort of all our private landowners that make up the KT network, can they put their carbon um, out on the market and receive some sort of benefit that way? You know, KT would maybe help facilitate, but we wouldn't be involved in the process. Therefore, it wouldn't be considered compensation through us, um, which would waive their liability. But seeing if that's an option, so starting to have those conversations and just keeping that creative thinking going on how to support landowners that offer this opportunity for our state. Abby, just to kind of summarize that, I know you dropped it in the board, yeah. um, so it's there in your own words, but would you say like there's new technology that are creating new opportunities for management of mm -hmm. resources? I don't know if it's new technology, like I know A&R has LIDAR stuff. It's just done every maybe eight or 10 years. Becca, Michael, correct me. <laughs> I don't know this technology <laughs> very well myself, but but there are um, startup organizations like uh, popping up. There's one in St. Johnsbury called Whiteout Solutions, and they're able to fly drones um, in specific areas, um, you know, over a sensitive area that we might have recognized in our trail network. And we can really look at the train, um, uh, you know, during the off season. So we're not just like, you can look at it in different perspectives instead of um, just adding to being boots on the ground. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Um, all right, any other, any other comments, new opportunities or new challenges related to stewarding outdoor recreation resources? There's, I know there's a lot of comments here in the mirror board, so just zooming in there for a minute. Um, I know we haven't heard from some folks yet. I'm curious if you have anything else to add. Um, Kim, I know we haven't heard from you. Um, anyone else who hasn't chimed in? I just saw Kim say that she's bounced into another meeting at 1130, so she might be phasing oh. out. Got you. Great. All right, well, seeing no more comments, I'm going to move us along to our next pillar. So um, let's look at the pillar for strengthen the quality and extent of outdoor recreation resources. Um, 
So again, thinking about you know new opportunities, new challenges since 2018, um, anything that's gotten easier, um, or anything anything that's come up in the past few years that uh, we didn't we didn't experience when we were creating the plan last time. So again, strengthening the quality and extent of outdoor recreation resources. And I'll look for hands or yeah, Hal, I see you unmuted. All right, and it looks like there's some activity in the board. Jackie, I'll add um, something that I've been talking to the Drills and Creamways Council a bunch about is this idea of um, really modernizing the Vermont trail system so that it uh, better offers incentives around improving the quality of, of trails from the planning and design phase to the trail maintenance phase. So I could see that as a great opportunity really is how um, how do we think about uh, improving the the quality of trails and the durability of them? Certainly, developing standards that help all organizations that are responsible for trail management do that in a way that ensures the environmental quality of the the resources that it's impacting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like we have a pretty good jumping off point with uh, the town forest planning toolkit that was developed a handful of years ago in collaboration with the urban and community forestry program. So we have something to build on uh, and I think we have a lot of energy with the individual members of the Trails and Greenways Council and um, just some thoughts about how to use the Vermont trail system as that um, mechanism. Nice. Abby. Um, so I love it. So I put in to the opportunities uh, that the town, the creation of the town forest toolkit is an opportunity to think um, about the Vermont trail system in new ways. Yeah. Great. Um, Drew, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted it. Uh, if it's windy, just let me know if some stuff picking up. But, you know, I think it's an opportunity also and a challenge to communicate somehow the the range of opportunities that are available. I mean, we can focus on strengthening, you know, all we want, but at the same point, we got to let people know where where opportunities exist, you know. And I I think that you know when I think back to the very first meetings we had pre VoRec with Governor Scott, you know, the very first thing that he wanted was an asset map of all the recreational opportunities and all the recreational businesses in the state and it seemed like such a simple idea at the time but it's obviously such a massive undertaking that i think there's a huge opportunity to help a lot of our problems by 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 showing people there's trails right outside their back door as opposed to sending them to the handful of trails that everybody goes to um you know but it's a challenge and that this is a, that's a massive undertaking uh, that's going to require uh, both time and capital investment to make that happen Thanks, Drew. I put a couple of notes in the in the board related to that. Um, that guy, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. I think similarly, um, looking at uh, what for state lands is is sort of increased attention being paid to, uh, not simply ADA accessible trails, but um, thinking more broadly about accessibility and what it means to develop a trail that provides a quality experience for the range of mobility challenged athletes. Um, and one opportunity I think I see there is, is potentially developing those standards or specifications that folks that are building trails and thinking about accessibility, um, what does it mean to, to develop a trail that, that maybe doesn't meet ADA requirements because that creates a certain experience that not all uh, athletes are looking for. So are there other other types of um, trail experiences and what specifications would be needed to develop those? Thanks, Becca. Yeah, and I'm curious, so what do you see as the, um, so because 
I think we're thinking about the opportunities in terms of what's changed. And so do you think that the awareness around the the need for better accessibility of outdoor recreation is that sort of the change or the what's bringing on the new opportunity, would you say? I think um, if I had to characterize it, what I think would be, at least personally for me, is uh, an awareness now that I didn't have before that not everyone is 89 years old and rolling around in a in a wheelchair. Uh, so there are a lot of different types of experiences that people are looking for that um, we characterize as, you know, being needing some help with mobility, uh, but it's it's not my 89 year old grandmother in a wheelchair. It might simply be needing um, a retrofit to be able to get my boat in the water at an access point. Uh, I'm a great paddler. I just need help getting my boat from my car to the water, uh, that kind of thing. Thanks. All right, I'm seeing activity happening here in the board. Um, I'm seeing an opportunity listed for user fees. A backpack tax. I'm curious um, if who, whoever dropped this in would like to elaborate on that. Yeah, sure. That was me. It's Hal. Um, I think that um, it's it's something obviously that we didn't really talk about when we created all this four years ago, five years ago. But I think there's been more. I've seen it pop up more in national discussions around the increased participation. And, and therefore the increased burden that we put on our, our uh, infrastructure. And I think it's probably inevitable. I, I, nobody likes more taxes, right, or fees. But I think it's an inevitable conversation that we're going to have to have as an industry to, um, to address it. It's something that on the fish and wildlife side has been in place for, um, I don't know how long, Michael could probably provide that, but it's decades, I think, that those... Um, those forms of recreation have been um, have been experiencing this for a long time, and much of what they do is funded by these fees or taxes. Um, so I just think it's an in inevitable conversation, one that is probably not all that appealing, but um, we don't get to pick and choose, I guess, necessarily. Yeah. And the opportunity here is, you know, with the increased participation in the outdoors, um, is can I is are is that right Hal is that accurate you know you're saying with the increased use um there's this opportunity to correct um, as, a, as I think guess think about a, user fees yeah yeah a new funding source to um uh to, to to help counter that increase in 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 user participation yeah to follow up on that if you go to New Hampshire, you need a, essentially a parking pass to use any trailhead anywhere in the state. And, you know, it, that way it's people who are actually using the resources who are paying for it. And it would be interesting to see if there was a way to issue um, like a free automatic parking pass for anyone who ha is, I can't remember what the the food stamps cards are, uh, but I've seen that also, you know, in other places. I went to a museum in LA um, not that long ago. That if you were on food stamps, then you either I can't remember it's free admission or you know significantly reduced admission. But there are ways to kind of either waive that fee or make it considerably less in order to accommodate a more economically diverse uh, user group. But um, I, I think that. That is something that we really should think about. Um, I saw a couple of hands raised and then put down, so I'm assuming your comment was covered. Um, just looking here to see, we haven't talked a lot. I mean, we've talked about opportunities and challenges kind of combined. Um, just seeing if there's anything we haven't covered. Um, so I'm, I am seeing this note about supporting infrastructure needs to be in place, um, parking, crosswalks, bathrooms, et cetera. Um, 
I'd invite, you know, if if whoever wrote that comment would like to elaborate. Oh, that was mine. Um, yes. <laughs> I mean, if we want to improve outdoor recreation opportunities, you know, it's a holistic experience um, from from even entering the community that offers the experience. So um, earlier we were talking about cars idling, you know, traffic jams. So we want to make the whole flow of the experience ideal for everyone, even the locals who are in the communities that offer the, the rec opportunities, um, making sure, um, you know, even from wayfinding that um, the directions to get to the parking location to the trailhead is all uniform and all very clear and easily understandable. Um, so, you know, planning the outdoor recreation opportunity even weeks in advance. Um, so folks yeah. know how to enter into a community respectfully and have a good experience. So they keep coming back and then, and then move here and increase our population. Yeah. Join our workforce. <laughs> yeah. So, Abby, you're saying that the challenge is that uh, you know there the currently the in, there are needs in infrastructure um, that don't currently exist, and the challenge is as creating those better options for parking and crosswalks and bathrooms. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Especially in our especially in our rural areas, um, our downtown villages um, are pretty bare bones and um, not up to date with infrastructure. So kind of going back to what Ed and Melanie were, were sharing about widening roads and, you know, some of those types of approaches can support outdoor recreation. Great. Hal, mm -hmm. I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to tag on to what Abby said. I think she really nailed it with that holistic experience term. And I would extend it even to like, as soon as people cross the border into the state of Vermont, we want to really be creating that ideal experience for them all the whole way. So I think it's a great term, holistic experience, if that's what you said, Abby. Yeah, I think it just, you know, I, it's so funny. I have right now it's like grant writing season and I feel like I've always share all the benefits of outdoor rec, but my like concluding paragraph <laughs> is always that the outdoor recreation opportunities can be like a platform for an ideal place for, for someone to live, work and play. And we, so you want that holistic experience. So people are attracted to um, <clears throat> not only just visiting, but wanting to make some of these, especially our rural areas home. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and that, so it's, the 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 experience needs to be taken into account even before they step on their first first foot onto the trail. Mm -hmm. Great, that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Great, Josh, go ahead. Yeah, I think that this is added on to something Becca said and a few others. Um, but as I was listening to this, you know, we're trying to expand opportunities and you know reduce overuse and you know I thought about what the Fish and Wildlife uh, Department did with the rule change expanding the fishing season to be year round you know catch and release during the off season now um, practically everywhere is going to uh, disperse the popular times and provide a better experience um, giving people more opportunity and less impact during the busiest times and like where else can we take that same approach um, with the other types of recreation? Are there seasons that can be expanded? Are there, you know, locations that we've set aside for one recreation use that really could be expanded to more? And I know there's conflict there, you know, but I, I think with all this attention, that should be a goal to look at, um, you know, there's other lands that are managed in the state, um, whether they're just state owned or they're town owned or they're someone owns them that was for one use that really could include more and help people have a better experience by reducing the overcrowding. And so I don't know really how to sum that up, but it's kind of like looking at how we've traditionally dedicated, you know, one use location seasons and thinking about how to relook at all those and see if there's more opportunities for 
um, you know, better experiences and easier ways for people to participate in outdoor recreation. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. That reminds me of the conversation that we were having earlier with the presenters around inviting a lot more communities in the state to do a recreation assessment of what kind of resources they have that either are available or might be available and just simply increasing the volume of of opportunities which would both um, you know reduce the impacts on the kind of overloved places but provide an opportunity and an impetus to more love to another place, uh, possibly a little economic love as much as of you know trail resource love. Uh, and I think that you know we start by looking at what we have and I think that we need to really start thinking a lot more about what could be. So I'm I'm saying it's an opportunity to to this increased interest to do to work with more communities on um, the assessment of our doing an outdoor recreation assessment. Um, great. So looking for any other hands raised or folks who want to chime in here again, just as a reminder, we're talking about strengthening the quality and extent of outdoor recreation resources, uh, the opportunities and challenges since since 2018. Okay. And seeing no one jumping in, I'm going to pull us over to a new pillar. Um, so we've we've talked a lot about this one already, I think, but we might have some more to add. So that this pillar is increased participation in outdoor recreation activities among all demographics. Um, so again, thinking about changes between 2018 to now, uh, new opportunities and new challenges. And it looks like we have some notes being dropped in already, looking for hands. Drew, go ahead. Yeah, I think the, the comment I made earlier from one of the other areas was probably appropriate into here. I mean, in terms of the new audiences, I mean, we do have a significant opportunity that, uh, you know, for the first time and perhaps ever outdoors is being marketed by businesses to a much broader audience, people of color and, uh, and in all backgrounds. And so that's a great opportunity. At the same point, I think we have to be very sensitive to our, our messaging about overcrowding and make sure we're not trying to you know speak out of both sides of our mouths like hey we want everybody but actually we're limiting access you know we, we have to be able to sort of walk and chew gum at the same time on that topic so just i thought that we could just move that over from where it was before into this category great i've added that Um, I'm also seeing invest in instructors and people who can facilitate development of new users as a opportunity. Um, specifically target diverse leaders. Um, so and just to expand on that or make sure I'm understanding that correctly, we're saying there's an opportunity because there are new leaders in the outdoor recreation space who um, are interested and have the capacity to do that work. Is that is that right for whoever wrote that one? Fine. And I think also we are seeing a much more diverse group of people showing interest in the outdoors. And they might not already be in Vermont, but Vermont has an opportunity perhaps to, you know, create a program that really intentionally welcomes more diverse group of users and and allows if you know figuring out how to um, 
really make it a, a welcoming space and it's a challenge. Um, sorry, Carrie, I, I think I lost you for that last little bit, but I think what I heard is the challenge is um, making the outdoors a more welcoming space for all. Okay, just doing a quick time check. Um, we are uh, getting close here on time to our public comment um, period, but I do you think we have time to talk about this one uh, a little bit more? I am seeing folks dropping things in the chat or in the board, and I encourage you to keep doing that. Um, any other comments to pull out for this pillar? Increasing participation in outdoor recreation activities among all demographics. Okay. Seeing none, I think um, I think we can quickly uh, we can just spend and I do want to save time for public comment, but I think since we just have one pillar left, if we can throw some ideas quickly out about our um, last pillar here, growing outdoor recreation related businesses and is an important one for the work for it does. So want to leave a couple minutes of time for this one. Um, so yeah, thinking about new opportunities and new challenges since 2018 with growing outdoor recreation related businesses. Um, Hal, I see you're unmuted. I'm not sure. Do you have a comment to add or? No, I don't. Sorry. No worries. Um, seeing a couple of quick things being written in here, and we talked about this earlier too housing, um, workforce development as a challenge. Um, I know Mark mentioned the safety issue earlier. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and write that in as well. Uh, Drew, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely something that has changed significantly from the outdoor business category, and that's the remote workforce. Um, I'm not sure how it factors in, but it certainly has changed the population of many of our outdoorsy towns, um, both in terms of people who work in the state who are now in a remote office, as well as people who work around the country from a remote office who are now in these locations. And I would really love to figure out a way to, particularly for the people who are working for companies around the country who now live in Vermont, how to sort of, you know, when they get called back to the office, um, that we keep them in Vermont somehow. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure how that is, but that's, you know, the remote workforce is definitely a new factor. Would you say that's, uh, well, it sounds like in particular, the challenge of keeping them here once they're called back to the office, I, I would say that's a challenge, but um, that also sounds it, like an opportunity. To totally, it could be a little bit of both. And, and it's also an opportunity to encourage um, remote workers to come here. <laughs> maybe it, maybe that's our big Venus flytrap. <laughs> you know, have them come work here until you get called back to the office and then stay. <laughs> like, Great. Thanks. Investment in, in Wi-Fi and uh, making sure that there are sufficient flights all over the place from BTV. Yeah, and, yes. you know, and, and on that business note, you know, I mean, I think there is a, I mean, myself included, as we've gone fully remote, it has definitely changed our our office needs, and uh, you know it's a different type of outdoor businesses. But you know, I think many of the companies that are in Voba uh, are, are all trying to figure out this this office thing. Um, anyway, it's it's a big it's a big conversation, and none of us really know where it's going. Um, I am looking over here at opportunities. Uh, we we do have quite a few challenges identified. Any opportunities? Um, Josh, I see it. you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah, I think that the worker safety one needs to be further defined. I mean, I, I think without, I think leaving that there, it might be like occupational hazards of these outdoor jobs. And I think what Mark was getting at is specific to Burlington's um, lack of police force or whatever, you know, whatever is going on in Burlington.